There's a fly in my soup. <laughs> <laughs> there is, dude. <laughs> You're so- oh, because dude. Let's just, let's just. You are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. You're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, welcome back to the bomb hole. <laughs> presented by... Solomon Snowboards. Thank you, Solomon, for supporting us. It means the world. Buds, how you doing today, bud? Not going to lie. Had better weeks, but you got to take the good with the bad. Let's go. It's <laughs> <laughs> a motivational speaker over here. You know what I'm saying? I though? love it. Well, this week we got Seth Hewitt in the hot seat. Seth, what's going down? Dude, I love that intro. It gets me so hyped. Like the Winnebago man hit in there. Oh, dude. You guys are crushing it. Thank you. Love it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this. This is awesome. Oh, we're so hyped. You're in the booth. And the thing I was thinking about the intro is there's kind of a Winnebago fly over the headlight, and we've been having flies in the booth. True. We have one fly named... uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum <laughs> from yes. the fly. That's but he. Has, I think he landed in your coffee yes, and I died. I Think he's in my he stomach. Sl- he slurped now. them up. <laughs> you know, today's actually bring your neighbor to work day. <laughs> is that true? Yes, Seth is my neighbor, and I thought <laughs> yeah. I thought I would just bring him down and see how it went. You know what I mean? Yeah. We live like two streets from each other, like pretty much parallel. Yeah, it's not sick. bad. How is it uh, having Stony Buds as a neighbor? How it's it? incredible. I go to his house every single year on Halloween with my kid, and it's just like it's just it's like okay, what's going to happen when the door opens? <laughs> is there going to be just a rush of animals? It's like you know, you never know. You never know. Is he sub- does he get candy? He oh yeah, he like, gives the fattest candy bars. I give his kid extra large. Candy bars. <laughs> <laughs> One time we showed up, there's just an empty bowl, and dude, it was like so <laughs> early. <laughs> I was dying. It was just like well, sitting out there those, by the porch. Those, Some of those kids just come and take your whole bowl of candy. Man. It was oh, yeah. You got to specify. Take yeah. one, or else oh, they yeah. go full handful. There's those bad kids, dude, yeah. that take them can't, all. Man. Uh, can't blame them. But for I'll that. tell you what, dude. I'll I'll see this dude rolling down the street on a motorcycle. With a BMX bike on the back, maybe a skateboard in the mix somewhere, and I'm always just like, that dude's a badass, and it's sad. <laughs> like when I pulled up to your house that one day, I was just like, like wow, dude. <laughs> it looks pretty crazy. I've seen good. you, and I had no clue it was you. What's going on? Did you weld like a bar or some shit to hold your bike? Yeah, it's like, well, I mean, bike on bike, right? Nothing better. And um, yeah, like the whole crew kind of that we ride BMX with, like, has Harleys and like, yeah, we fully just like welded up a sissy bar one day and it was like, all right, cool. This works. And like, I, I, I took it on a trip once to Jackson, like rode from like Salt Lake to Jackson with the BMX bike on the back. Yeah. And there's and, a time when there's a crew. Yeah. Yeah. Total posse. Wow. Yeah. It's been pretty died down. I, my, my bike isn't registered or anything for the last couple of years. So it's like, neither it's is my car. Chilling. I get that dude. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, on a given day, like you show up to the, to the spot and there's just like a bunch of bikes dude let's talk about the spot i know we're not going chronological yeah but fuck it. i actually stumbled upon you in tanner park in salt lake city and these guys have a whole underworld of just like insanely beautiful bmx jumps that are perfectly sculpted there's fucking 30 40 50 of these beautiful jumps what's the scene like down there i mean it's it's incredible. Like I had you know, like getting introduced into that world of, you know, BMX riding and meeting everybody down there and like, you know, just kind of opening up my world to that and understanding that these guys like have the most dedication of all time to like maintain a spot, ride these jumps, build this perfection and yeah, man, it's like there's nothing better than it. It's insane. And it's like it takes a lot of hours. It's a lot of dedication, you know, and there's, it's just like ups and downs and everything. But, um, yeah, it's like the coolest thing that I've like, I don't know how, like, I discovered it at 37 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I mean, just to kind of walk it back, like, when I was a, a kid, you know, like, I think I was like maybe – 18 or something like that you know bmx i kind of got introduced because my friend was into it and i bought a bike and you know 
somebody had like we tried to dig like some crappy jumps somewhere you know obviously like and yeah i just started like riding and and you know maybe hit like three like four foot jumps you know and i rode for maybe a year and kind of got a little taste of it and it was like oh this is cool you know but then stopped sold my bike then snowboarding was like my entire life for however many years and then actually how i got into it was um like again i guess is uh my kid's five when he was five and um someone's like he gets a bike you know like every kid has a bmx bike or a bike so i'm like oh cool and we're cruising around and then someone's like yeah you should go up and check out these like dirt jump park at park city and i'm like oh okay cool yeah we go up there and i walk in the gate and they have up in park city there's an actual like dirt park where there's real jumps and i walk in the gate and it's it's open to public and it's like it's like maintained by the city it's it's, it's dialed and i walk in the gate and i'm like blown away there's these all these kids just ripping. And I'm like, this place, like, this exists? Because, like, way back when, you know, when I first started, uh, you know, like, I kind of got, like, I, a little snippet of the scene. And there was, like, you know, got introduced to these jumps. And they're massive jumps. And, like, I just watched those dudes ride, like, one day down at these trails, uh, kind of by the Jordan River. And it was, like, I was just, like, this is crazy. Like, I don't ever see myself doing this, like terrified. Right. But then when I come back to it, I'm looking at this and I'm like everything that I learned from snowboarding and like, you know, just like all the different experiences that I've had and the, the knowledge of speed, airtime, lips, jumps, landings. And I'm like looking at this and I'm like, I am doing that. I don't care what it takes. I am doing that. And I don't know, man. I just like looked on KSL. I bought one of those like dirt jump mountain bikes, like 26 inches to start and like started going, like doing all the like normal typical spots and got, and it was just like, this is insane. This is super cool. Like this is the raddest feeling. It's like flying through the trees and the dirt and you're just, this is like snowboarding on like, you know, they, they call it like brown powder, you know? Is that whatever. what they call it? <laughs> they, I think powder. they do. Like <laughs> brown pal. I've heard that. Oh, I don't know. So bikers. <laughs> but what then I met. I, I was gonna go. Hurt. Yeah, I was gonna go buy my kid like a legit BMX bike. So um, I go down to this bike shop, kind of by um, my buddy's place, and it was like walk in there, and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get this bike for my kid, and um, he's like, sick, and I just started chatting him up. Come to find out, it's, like, this kid Cam Wood, and he's, like, a pro bike rider from Salt Lake, and, like, he's in the scene with, like, you know, all the dudes, and we just started talking, and next thing you know, like, he's, he's like, the guy at Tanner Park where all the, like, the legit, home, like, loked out spot is, and he's, like, you should come down someday and check it out, and I'm, like, yeah, I'd love to. I'd come take photos. I go down there, and my mind's just blown, like, taking photos, and, like, this is insane, and, like, just started talking to him and he's just like, yeah, man, if you learn how to build jumps, you can ride them. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm doing this. So you've already had plenty, plenty of experience building jumps, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it really, it really, I mean, it's the same thing. It's training. Yeah. I mean, those, those jumps are steep and the gaps and everything. But like, once you figure out how to like sort of work the dirt and like what the, the, the like water to dirt ratio is, cause you can't just work with like dry dirt. It t it's an art. It's like it's lit legit art. Really. And once you once you learn how to shovel and butter out a jump, it's like phew, Dude, the sickest thing ever. You roll down there from for the layman's that don't know anything about BMX like myself. I go down there. There's like I don't know, 15 people there. Everybody's shoveling. Everybody's working on the jumps. And then they got this whole irrigation system with PVC and water to keep everything dialed oh, really? in. They got tarps on the jumps. And then like all of a sudden it's done. And then these guys are hitting like. 30 40 foot jumps on a friggin' bicycle <laughs> flying through the air it's it's unreal i was like blown away it was really cool to see that shit what do you like better building the uh snowboarding ones or the bmx or what's easier what's harder uh i would say that you know snowboarding you just got those big massive scoops and you just go to it you yeah know, you stack it up you know you get a hard board packet and you rip it yeah you know? more of a science to the yeah dirt. with the dirt you you know you gotta like Make sure you're getting right the right dirt, you know, because it kind of varies, and there, you know, you got to pack it, and like it takes, a, it's a little bit of a process. Yeah, but once you build it, it's kind of there. You know, we have to, we literally, it takes a month and a half every season, 
you know, to go down and reshape them and rebuild them because like oh, the winter destroys them. Wow. Yeah. So it's gnarly. It's so much dedication. And when I switched over to like an actual BMX bike, that's when it got really fun. So it was, it was quick. It was like a couple months. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I wanted to run back to uh, some of the earlier days and I know you grew up, uh, well, basically in Salt Lake City, but I know you moved around a lot as a kid. Was that, did that have a hard effect and where did you live and all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, um, I have, like, my both my parents are from northern Minnesota, super small town. Um, and, yeah, I never really lived there, like, maybe one year kind of in, in transit by, while we were moving around. But my dad w- uh, works for, like, a – or did work. He's retired now, but he worked for, like, a big uh, construction company that built, like, power plants. So they get these big jobs, you know what I mean? And the jobs last maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe maybe five years, maybe ten years, you know? It just all kind of depends. And we were in, um, we were in kind of the the rhythm where we moved almost every year from, you know, like when I was really young, we didn't move too much. I lived in like, I was born in North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota. And I lived like somewhere there. And then we moved to Washington state up north of Spokane. And I think we spent like three years there, right? When I got into like first grade, I think I put in that. And then from there moved down to um, Alabama for like six months and then from there, moved up to Mass. You live put, in Massachusetts? Yeah. Short time Mass. No, let's, give, let's give him a couple little mini air horn for the Massachusetts. Yeah, what, small. What was the reason time. for all this moving? Well, the jobs would end. You what, know, what was your dad doing? He was he was purchasing all of the equipment that it took to build like a power plant or wow. like an incinerator or whatever it was. So the job ends. It's new yep. town. That Tra- must have been wild for you. Transfer. It was gnarly. And I have two brothers, so there's three of us, and um, you know we're all pretty close, like two years apart, basically, and just super homies. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was, dude, it's hard on a kid. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. How is it with the friends, man? You you get a group of friends and you're out. That's Always got to make new yeah. ones, huh? Yeah, no, that was, a, that was a big thing, you know, not keeping, like, consistent friends. And I was, like, kind of a shy kid. I'm not, I'm not like, super, like, cruising around and just, like, talking to all the kids at school um, and real mellow. So it, it took me a while, but I did meet friends everywhere, you know. But for the most part, it was, like, my brothers were my best friends, you know. We would always do stuff and and hang so that's tough that that's it's gnarly it's like mm-hmm. it's kind of harsh on a kid but well yeah. we have so much stuff to cover and i know you grew up in salt lake and you know you got sponsored and all that and then eventually you know your dream came true and you were able to film for mac dog and i kind of wanted maybe paint a picture of what that meant for you and and all that stuff yeah i mean like Growing up as a kid, you know, worshiping snowboarding, Mac Dog movies were like the pinnacle. Like, you know, back from, you know, Meltdown Project, you know, the Transworld snowboard videos that he did. I watched those all the time. Um, and it, it was just like w- me and my friends would just watch snowboard videos and go snowboarding. So, you know, the Mac, the Mac Dog videos were just always like the ones. He cut them like you know super fast punk rock and you know it was just like the sickest videos so you know when i when i got into snowboarding you know my my the only goal i ever had was just like i want to have a mac dog part or or a video part for that for that matter and um i actually like you know started out i filmed with whitey i got an opportunity through you know blue capita and you know he put in a personal favor got me in with whitey filmed with LeBlanc the first year and Ollie Goulet, like these vets, J2. And it was just gnarly, dude, just getting tossed in. And I'm just like this kid. And, you know, I, you know, I grew up, like, like made it happen sort of like with a sponsor me tape. That's kind of how I got in the game. You know, it's like, oh, well, if I want a video part and three chip cameras just dropped, like with the digitapes. So it was like newer technology and it was easier to get it into a computer and make a part. So that, like, was the catalyst to like make a tape. And then when I made that like videos, like all the homie videos and you know, my part, um, it landed somewhere and, and people saw it and then, yeah. And it was just kind of like, what kind of clips are we talking in the sponsor me tape? That's what I'm wondering. I don't know. I mean, two it rails weren't really 
a thing. Okay. Like I grew up like like a kickers, like hitting bright, bright and backcountry. Like my first backcountry jump is like a hundred feet off the run, and it was like you cut the line, like you know, right above the the they call it the barbecue hip, but okay. just in the back. Like first wind lip. First wind lip was my first jump ever. And it's like, I was in the back country and it was literally like a hundred yards from the <laughs> run, <laughs> but it was like, Oh, like you cross that line. And it was like, dude, dude I'm out here. <laughs> 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 you felt like you were so deep, but yeah. you're like, oh, you see people just like riding by. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I had like, I, my banger was like, a, I did a cab nine on a swimming pool. <laughs> that was like the Early kind of like too, in the game huh? that's dope that'll get you that'll still get you spawns today I yeah pro- i probably did maybe two or three more cap nines my entire <laughs> career <laughs> and that was probably the best one i ever did so um no i did i did that there was like little rails and then and then just getting tossed into it like mikey took me on a rail trip the first year filming for brainstorm mikey and shane shane had a huge part in pulling me in shane charlebois and mikey leblanc for yes. the layman's yeah, Charlebois, and um, yeah. So he took me on a rail trip to the East Coast. We went up to Vermont, like first time ever. Like I board set a, a couple rails, like hit a couple things, like here and there, but never hit a kink rail. First kink rail ever was that we showed up to the tunnel in Burlington, and you know there's a triple kink, and then there's just the double, mm-hmm. and it was just like, all right, just start. Let's start do going this. For it. Just board slid it. I ended up making it. I was so hyped, but I was terrified <laughs> like nothing to warm up on you know it was just like all right you gotta go like luckily i was like young enough and could take some bales <laughs> and was that happy hour or is that brainstorm that was in brainstorm that was brainstorm yeah okay yep yeah and so putting in like two years and two years with uh kingpin and then um jeremy called me and, and invited me to film and for shakedown and it was just like dream come true man and it was crazy. I didn't even know, like, what I was getting myself into. Like, it was just, like, getting into this, like, machine of video parts. And these dudes were so dialed. And, like, you know, they'd done it for so long and, like, knew what they wanted, knew how to film. I was just green and, like, no idea what I was getting myself into. Like They were at the top of their game at this point. Top. Which, like, like the top dogs. Did you know Jeremy well already? I mean, like, when I was coming up, like, a couple of my friends were always, like, trying, you know what I mean? Like, like kind of knew them. You yeah. know, I'd go, buy, I, bought, I, bought, like, a, I bought a Type A off Jeremy. Like, uh, he's selling it. It's like, 200 bucks. First sale ever or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or no, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was, like, at their house. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I bought a board off him. So, we, I, like, knew yeah. him, but I didn't, they weren't, like, homies, you know. He they probably, they talent. were probably just, like, oh, yeah, these little kids, like, yeah. whatever, like, around Brighton and you know, whatever, but, but yeah, I mean, that was huge. That was just like going in there and, and the, like Jeremy just got on Burton and he was just fired yeah, up. Bet. JP was like, you know, he was still on forum or, you know, obviously. And he was just fired up. These guys were going for it. Like our first trip we went up to, up to Burlington and you know, the, the, the Burlington high yeah. yeah. And that's when JP was like going at it, like switch back to, cab to back lip it was just like a clinic and i was just tossing carcass because i didn't know what yeah, else I'm to do with these guys yeah i'm like trying tricks i'd never even tried before and dying like, dying yeah but it was just like i had to you know what i mean did that you was... instantly vibe with these dudes because i mean you guys ended up becoming best friends yeah i mean it was all i don't know i it was like i didn't think that they liked me <laughs> you get the two of them together you're not sure because they're like dude they're not going to give you anything yeah you get them together and they're no. probably giving you more of a hard time than anything they're not going to give you anything yeah. like i just had to like i don't know i i guess i just didn't go away and like i was just down to shovel down to work and like and they like that i i hope yeah. <laughs> and then and i remember the like the time like jeremy was just all of a sudden like calling me and texting me and everything and i was like wait, does he like me now? <laughs> <laughs> Same with JP too. I, I, I couldn't tell for like the whole year, you know, because those guys were going at it. Yeah, like, It took me like 20 years to figure yeah. out if they like me or not. Yeah, totally. They do now, but I, yeah, it took a while. You got to break in with these guys. And then one thing circling back around to what you're just saying, I always found an inspiration uh, in people like Mikey LeBlanc and yourself 
because you know you you appear to me to be like pure work ethic, right? You have your you have your JP Walkers, your Jed Andersons that are just like just naturally just it's just gifted, you could say. And then there's people that you can tell just work for it. And you know what was your mentality in there? Like, were you just outworking people? You feel like, or I don't know. I mean, maybe because I'm definitely not like talented, like naturally <laughs> talented. No, I'm not, say, I'm not saying that. I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no, no. I'm, I'm straight up saying yeah. that. Yeah, work your ass off. Though. Yeah, every every single clip I ever got was something. You know what I mean? Every single you had one. To earn. There, there was nothing. There was one time, one time, my entire <laughs> career that something came easy. And it was a fluke, and Pierre didn't film it, but we had another filmer, Will. He filmed it. It was this, I think it was like a switchback lip. Terrified of that trick for ever. And um, we, we show up to the spot in um, Evanston, a little straight rail, and it had this wall that juts yep. out. Mm -hmm. And there's like a three-foot gap. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so if you, you, if you, you know, like the, the go-to move is like jump over the rail and ride down the, the side with no stairs. Mm -hmm. But that really wasn't an option. And we were just getting going, you know, at the spot. And I was just like, all right. And I, I'd just been working on that move. So I was like, I got to film a switchback lip. You know what I mean? I, n I need to film one. And um, I just laced it, like, first try. Damn. First try. And, and I was so stoked. And, like, Pierre was just kind of, like, looking at me because he was, like, trying to figure out his angle. He's like, all right, whatever, <laughs> you know. And Will was at the top of the stairs filming. And, um, uh, and he's like, hey, do you think you want to do that again? And I'm like, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, I, I did another trick. You know yeah. what I mean? I had another trick in mind on that. Like the switchback lip just kind of cl uh, clicked like when I was there. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to put one up, see what happens. Did it. And I was like, oh, you got that? Right, done. <laughs> was only, that was the only one that Dude, ever. He FT? is not ready FD, man. We no. need like third try. That's perfect. Dude, that's when you get hurt though. And they're like, yeah. hey, can you do it again? You're like, yeah. no, no adrenaline, nothing going through your body. You just clip. You definitely, and die. if someone says no, you do not push them yeah. to do it again, man. That's bad. And then bad move. Going back to, to the very first session, that it was like October 9th, dude, and Calgary gets like hit with snow. Get invited to Mac Dog. First film trip comes together. I'm like sweating. I'm like, dude, I'm not ready. I don't want to go. And and um, everyone's like, you know, I was kind of like feeling some pressure from like some of the filmers. They wanted to get going and start filming. And I was I went on the trip with uh, John Cooley, and then we were meeting T.J. Schneider up there because he was local, so he knew all everything. We show up to this rail, like sick, like down long rail, not too steep, like square bar, epic handrail. I don't know. It's probably. People have done a lot of stuff on it, I think. Same thing, like, first try, basically, or third try. No, it's it third try. I front boarded it. Just, like, locked, center binding, all the way through, boom, landed. Is it one of those giant ones in Calgary? It's was, it was pretty long, and it was long at the time. It was a legit shot. Yeah. Like, it was legit. I don't think it had been done. Sick. I, at least I, I hadn't known. And I was just like, I was like, it's on. <laughs> so stoked. And then... um. Of course, like the filmer, he didn't. He was. He wasn't even out of the car yet. <laughs> Still in the car. Yeah, and, and I was just on. like, and, and but and then in my head, I was like, okay, well that came easy, and I was like, okay, cool. And I was, uh, I was teeing up uh, like a front board pretzels at that time, like in preseason, because I had like a couple days preseason. Those were hot. Those were a yeah, hot. That was a hot item hot at that time for a bit. That 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 was the year for that. Like JP had done them the year before, so everybody was trying yeah. to get one in their part the next year. And I was teeing them up, and I was like, I did it like right away. I got really close, and I was like, All right, I got this. This is gonna be sick. This is like a loot, super long rail. Like my my brain started going, and then one time I just came out a bit early, landed on the stairs, and again there's like a corner like a brick corner and just like went in like center binding, like skidding into my butt Oof. and just slammed it. And I just like jacked my like knee a bit. Oof. And I was like, no, I was so bummed. Took me out of the session, freaked me out. I like ended up changing my flight, going home, freaking losing it, going to the doctor, like all this stuff and ended up like totally healing. And like, it took like a week, you know, it was just, it was just, Bruised or something. But to put it into context, this was your first opportunity 
to film for the biggest project of your life, your dream project, and you just yeah. and, the, and the filmer was still in the car when you actually landed a shot. <laughs> Good to know the Mac Dog crew works as loose as some of the other crews. You know, <laughs> it wasn't Mike. Mike wasn't on that trip. Yeah, he would have been out Mike there. Mike wouldn't have been doing that, huh? <laughs> yeah, but that happened, and I was just like tripping, and it kind of sent that kind of that year like that kind of tossed me, you know. And then going in, I was just getting wrecked. Oh, very first film trip too for Mac Dog, like session in this kink rail on like some rest stop in in um vermont with mikey and um i was i don't know what i was trying i think i was trying like just 50 50s and i came off weird and like landed put my like hand and i was like guiding my hand like a, like using the handrail how it should be used but yeah. i was on a snowboard <laughs> and my thumb hooked and i broke my thumb Oof. like bad and i was just like dude and this was before thanksgiving at this time, because we were getting some early snow, so bummed. But I was like, I was like, I don't care. I just, I went right home. I got one of those like plastic casts, little splint, and I just rode the rest of the year with that thing. All year, dude. Thumbs hurt. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. And then like not too deep, like first backcountry session two, I kind of jacked my ankle. So I was like kind of having a rough go there, but it it reeled it reeled back in, and I ended up getting a couple clips, and you know had a part, and it was the sickest thing, like me personally you know i was so super hyped so yeah that shakedown part must have skyrocketed the career at that point especially was that, yeah. that was shakedown right yeah that yeah. was shakedown yeah uh to the sounds yeah. like jeremy was like mm. heard this band he's like yo dude you gotta check this band out and they're like he saw him on like letterman i think i don't know and <laughs> like as we were just listening to it the, and then when it kind of came time like hey what song do you want i was like I don't know, the sounds. <laughs> and it was kind of like the hot band, but it was cool. They ended up getting the rights. So I have to admit the Capita board that it had a worm on the bottom or something? What was on the bottom? It was a it was an arm. A it was arm. like a green. Yeah. The, the, it was uh the human five artists. That was my favorite graphic that's ever Capita's ever done in the history of their brand. Really? Yeah. I don't remember the arm. I actually rip if you look at some of the salamander boards that I've designed over the years, they're like basically I sent the artist like pictures of that board. I thought it was so sick. So it's sick. I got one on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. That's dope. Yeah, those guys are awesome. They they created some super forward thinking snowboards. What were you saying earlier? You were talking about the early days of Capita before we started recording. And you were talking about being in an assembly line, like making boards by hand. What give us a little context of that story. Yeah, so it's like Capita was launched. I was on um Jason Brown and Blue. And um, the factory was up in Surrey, BC. It was a Rev factory. And um, yeah, it was like the second year in production and everything was super late and like everybody was stressing out. And I just was, and I was talking with Blue and he's like, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm going to go up there and work in the factory. And I'm like, buy me a flight. I'm coming. Like, I don't care. And we totally, I just like flew up to Seattle, jumped in the car. We ro drove across, went up there and like, finished boards like coming off of the you know the, the the whole process we would finish them and and you know put the little like get all the little like rub marks out of them and everything and put them in the plastic and everything and it was it was sick it was a yeah it was the second year of capita and um that was that was such a cool experience to just be able to be like i'm in there i i was like well if the the company needs help like i'm down so blue was probably stoked yeah everyone was like in there like working it was so. jason uh J is it jason? jason brown jason brown yeah that, yep. he was did he start it as well or just, yeah it was yeah. blue jason and then kevin jones was um teed up to 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 be on capita they actually they're like prototypes like he had like a pro model and um yeah randomly i don't know i was like on um i was on airwalk like head to toe and I was up at Mount Hood, and I had a bunch of Milo stickers on my board, and you know, just snowboarding. And then, um, I don't know, I guess Blue was up there because he was actually kind of transitioning out of his role at K2. He's like the like K2 marketing or team manager, you know, doing everything there. And he was just like, wait, who's this kid with, like, Milo stickers on their board? Like, I, you know, because he lived in Utah forever with you. Yeah. And forever. And he's like, oh, it's Milo. Like, why, why, do I, why don't I know this kid? And he never said anything. Like, I just went on my merry way. And then randomly it was a funny story crazy story like airwalk kind of like fell apart and um like they're like the team manager that was really like t taking me under his wing he left to go work for burton 
And, um, and, uh, so that was kind of like, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to really ride for Airwalk because Airwalk was cool. Like they make good stuff, really sick snowboards. But at the same time, I was just kind of like, I don't know. Like, I don't really, you know, don't really, don't really vibe. And then, um, and then blue literally like called me like a week later after I kind of was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, after that call came and I was kind of bummed and I was just like, I'm in. <laughs> he just said he's like jason brown i'm like i'm in down yeah. <laughs> i haven't finished my sentence but uh it wasn't okay. e it wasn't even a company it wasn't even anything and i was like i'm in i don't care like there was like stencils you guys were spray painting yeah shit. i remember like and then look at it now it's they got their own goddamn factory it's one of the oh, top five the board brands is it yeah, yeah. numbers oh, numbers yeah. wise capital rules like they're, the, the the way they're crushing the way that that happened and that was good. Especially to go from, Seriously. like, a little writer-owned thing to being one of the yeah big producers of boards. That's insane, man. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That I mean, that's, like, the true story of, like, the snowboard industry. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, a rider that's, like, kind of moves on, takes a big risk. I mean, Blue put up everything he ever mm -hmm. had, put it into that brand, and then did it. Did it. Like, it's did. And, still and he's got a factory. It. Yeah, factory. And it's, like zero emissions and super good and it's got like good ethos and you know supports a lot of snowboarders and sure it was rough i'm sure for him but Dude, i bet the factory parts the heart the roughest part of the whole operation over there wow i could only factories are just you know it's insane yeah a lot of moving parts okay well i think it might be time to pivot into Woo! a little segment you speaking know of pivot did you guys watch um the last dance with with my, yeah. the Michael Jordan story, oh, oh god, yeah. so good. I grew up in that whole era and like coming through like with like the jazz, you know, like oh, in the yeah, last two finals. In the jazz, and up. I have to admit, I am or was. I don't. I can't even. I can't even claim that I'm a Fairweather fan. But back then, dude, I was the gnarliest Fairweather you fan. Were. Like, oh yeah, when they made the first year finals, I was just like, jazz. I'm watching every game. Was that like, like stocked in the Malone days? Stocked in the Malone, oh, yeah. <laughs> dude. It was the sickest. And then the the first year goes down, and it's like we're all the homies and like screaming at the TV, so stoked. Michael Jordan just like rising to the top, and you're. I was like so like wanted the Jazz to win so bad, but at the same time, I'm watching perfection yeah. in front of me, and I'm like losing my mind yeah like, this dude is the best athlete of all time and then literally the next year same people same place we're watching him in the finals again doing it again and i was just like well, well sickest thing ever and then yeah. the dude, somebody with the pizza supposedly poisoned them or some shit <laughs> what? or whatever poop was. you haven't watched the last day i gotta watch dude, this. it makes you want to run through a fucking brick wall dude it is really the most inspirational thing anybody yeah. watching or listening to this go on netflix and watch the last dance with michael jordan and you will be so motivated you know like oh, it's it, it's we're a, talking about running through brick walls i literally here, like wanted to get off man. my couch and just run through a fucking wall i was that fired <laughs> up and it resonated too because like like as a kid like i came up just like you know i love michael jordan yeah. everyone did it was on everything mcdonald's nikes everything was like Michael Jordan and, and, and then like now, you know, seeing that story and like being like reflecting on like, oh yeah, oh yeah, the dream team, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember, you know what I mean? And now you can kind of maturely It all comes think, back to you. Yeah, and you maturely kind of think about it and you're like, that was really what was going on, dude, this dude is so sick. So sick. Yeah. His shit talking is also unparalleled. Really? No, dude, I, I didn't know wait. that. I didn't he know just, he was gnarly. I didn't know that either. And, and the worst, he was, talk about, we talk about spite boarding on here sometimes, like when somebody says you can't do something and you're fueled by spite, he's like spike boarding X a hundred, dude. If you were like, somebody was like, hey, Mike, uh, it felt good to beat you tonight or something. He'd like stew on it and then literally just humiliate whoever yeah, was really? guarding him the next yeah. time. Yeah. It was I mean, I think that's what fueled him as a competitor. You know, like he wanted to be the best and he made it personal against people. And yeah. that's, I think he tried, I think he, I mean, I can only speculate, but like to me, he found out that that's what fueled him. So then he made everything personal. Yeah. And he just wanted. Because so, it pushed him to the next yeah, level. Just, that is dope. Well, Seth, we're going to do a little segment. It's called Name That Video Part. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I'm sweating. <laughs> Name that video part. 
Name that video part is presented by the Dew Tour, one of the best events in snowboarding. They support us. Make sure you support them. If you get a chance to check out the event, it's incredible. 11 out of 10 would recommend, huh, buds? Yeah, I would say so, bud. Okay, well, uh, Seth, how are you feeling as far as confidence? <laughs> you feeling good? You feeling bad? You nervous? I'm nervous. Okay. Straight up. <laughs> okay, well, this one's a little bit, I'm just going to say misty. Okay, here we go. Bjorn Linus. <laughs> Scramble. <laughs> chimes. Six minutes of chimes. All he needed to was end one the movie. chime. One chime and he was ready to go. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is a one chime man over here. One chime man. I'll tell you what. You know what? You got that yourself. Was an, that was an incredible part, by the way. Yes, he does. He hits Chad's gap. It's wow. great. So uh, Igloo Coolers sent us a whole bunch of these bomb hole branded coolers. You got a prize pack with uh, some bomb hole goods inside the cooler. You guys are too nice. And, this is amazing. Uh, yeah. So stoked. Congrats on uh, getting the W on Congrats, that. Congrats, dude. Big I mean, win. Fast shouts win. to the, your guys' like, marketing and your illustrations. That just Who wouldn't want this? This is the sickest thing ever. <laughs> Thank you. That's dope. Appreciate that, Seth. I'm glad you got it right. A lot of people get nervous. I'm the... sweating. You guys teed that one up for me, yeah, though. Yeah, it's kind, kind of made it easy. Up, dude, it's like he knows that movie. The chimes, though? The chimes. 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 Okay. Chimes can't, can't for the, forget times, the chimes, dude. So, okay. So we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be doing a two-parter, and Volcom is going to be giving away a little $100 gift card for the first song. Seth, you want to talk about that? Seth works for Volcom, for those who don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is like definitely what I look forward to in the show, this section. So, yeah, we teed up a little $100 you know, e-com code for the website to go on and get whatever you want um, if you get this song right. So. Okay, and then the second song will be a bomb hole prize pack. Yeah, and so. I got a little, like, additive for the for the bomb hole prize pack. I like so. good additive. Yeah. We got additives going. We, a little booster pack. If you so will. probably in the comment you want to specify song one and then song two. Good and song. song. Song one is for the Vulcan prize. All right. And song two is for the bomb hole prize. Okay, and as you know, comment on Bombhole's Instagram for this one. And it'll be a, the first picture of Seth. That's, that's where we pick the winner. Here we go. Song one. Quick. It's quick. They always are, buds. You got to earn your $100, huh? Yeah. Okay, and then yeah. the second one is for the Bombhole prize bag. Here we go. I think I got the second one. Yeah, you want to win a bomb? Bud, <laughs> coming through. No, well, I got. I want to, the fans to win. To add to it, I have a in the plastic double VHS of Happy Hour and After Hours wow. tape oh, set. That was when you guys were like Dave England and everybody was like being maniacs, like Jackass era stuff. That was bulletproof. Oh, bulletproof. but this is after hours. Okay, yeah, after hours was. Oh, dope, it's Ika getting drunk and shit like that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's got like crazy like party edit, <laughs> and then also a um, the a scrambled download project kind of like there's like th they made seven web videos before web videos were a thing, I guess, and there's like a, a DVD in the plastic too. Nice Killer. prize. Yeah. People are going to be. It's hyped. a booster pack, is what yeah, we call it. Booster. A booster pack. Okay, well, we want to thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. As always. Shouts to the do tour. Yeah, I think uh, this would be a good time to announce the fan giveaway as oh, well. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's let's hit that giveaway. The uh, bomb squad giveaway that we talked about on social media. We got a winner here. It's for it comes from our Patreon members. It comes to from clarify. our Patreon, and it's a fan giveaway and. This prize is a Snowboarder Mag season pass. You get, like, hoodie, beanie, every new issue of Snowboarder. The first one actually drops, like, next week. Big deal. And uh, baklava, all sorts of good stuff. Baklava or balaclava? Balaclava. Baklava is the good snack. Yeah. What am I throwing a baklava, too? <laughs> I mean, why not? You know what I mean? You know, pick yourself up but a baklava. But anyways, the winner of the prize is Adam Spears. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Props. Props to Adam. 
Let's give Thanks him a little. Should we give him a Give him, give him something. Yeah. What do you think? Maybe a gunshot too. Yeah, give him a, give gunshot, him a gunshot, air horn, whatever. Thanks for being a Patreon member. We appreciate you guys. Yeah. Okay. You know, we did. You mentioned uh, like in the name that video part, Chad's gap. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's get into it. I got a little. I got a little fun fact. Let's talk, Chad. Chad. <laughs> Chad's gap fact. Hey, Grandy, you, did you know that I sessioned a kicker with Stony Buds? Oh, yeah, is this true? What are we talking? <laughs> you know here? my memory. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Like we, yeah. wrote, we both I, wrote. I, I tee up a Switch Mickey. What are we talking? So up Grizzly Gulch at the infamous Chad's Gap before it was Chad's Gap. There's the sickest. The takeoff is the sickest, like tabletop style jump, and then it goes down and then up the tailing, the landing, the backside. And you shape out a sick like quarter pipe. I mean, yeah. So I it's a double. Before. It's the best double hit ever. Or you can you can hip it off the side and go into the landing of Chad's gap. But yeah, so I was up there with my homies, and all of a sudden, guess who shows up up the canyon late, <laughs> late in the day. Kind of my kind of my mo. Stony buds and Captain Stony oh, Shane Shalabaugh. And they come up, and they're just kind of, like, looking there, and we're building the jump, and they're just, like, we just started hitting it, and they're just kind of, like, stony. Uh, Shane said just something so stony and crazy, and he was just, like, yeah, so, like, he did made some analogy, you know, that he always makes. And then I'm, like, yeah, man, just let's hit this thing. Like, you guys, like, totally let's everyone hit it, and we sessioned, and we sat there and hit it. You were doing back ones. Shane All was right. doing front fives. Sick, and man. then it was right when you started shooting photos. And you just started like afterwards. I pulled. Yeah, out the yeah. You, you hit it a few times, and I think you did a back three and a back one. Oh, I used to like back ones a lot. Yeah. And Late then, back ones is what I liked. And then you ripped out the camera and took some photos of Shane, and I was like, I was all like, like did he take a photo of me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you did, dude. <laughs> And I was yeah. learning. I probably did, but like I probably Shane, got those slides somewhere. Shane was kind of like. I kind of like, you know, kind of like, you know, he had this kind of vibe flexing. going on. We were going a little good. bit, a little bit of flex. He's on we're Burton. talking good cop, bad cop scenario. Yeah, to- <laughs> oh, dude, totally. You guys probably schooled the backcountry back then. All the little kids out building jumps. <laughs> so I, yeah. To, to interrupt, did Buds throw one shovel full on the jump? Did he help? No. You? <laughs> okay. Nothing's no changed. way. Nothing's Get changed. My mammo, no dude, you know? way. And Shane kind of had this, uh, you know, kind of had this vibe, like he was pro snowboarder he was on burton yeah you know he was like killing it and then you were just kind of cruising you were kind of i don't know i didn't know who any of you guys were yeah and then i was just like maybe like later that year in the mags or something like that i think i saw a photo and i was like oh that's that dude shane and like <laughs> oh that's that dude ethan <laughs> and like you know what i mean and and then later on dude what's what is really sick is like from my sponsor tape you know that we filmed Shane started working for 411 mm. and and I actually submitted him some clips like that I had and he got it in like the the first the first tape the first that's issue. Sick. Yeah, yeah, it was sick. I think I had a and shot then, in that then, one as well. <laughs> and then and then it just went from there and then and then Shane was like a huge like part of getting me on the kingpin squad. Yeah, once he got working for Whitey, it was on. Yeah, that's so but cool. It was, it was dude. Sick, I didn't dude. even know that because I don't think I knew you back then. No. So I would love to see that Stony Buds back one. That's swagger amazing. Yeah. I've sessioned a jump with Stony Buds. That is so <laughs> tight. Fuck! I wish I could say the same. I don't think I can though. <laughs> well, we can probably with make it happen. So, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to transition into a cool topic. And, you know, for people that don't know, you've had an incredibly long <laughs> career on a snowboard. Uh, you know, heavy video parts, enders, the Red Bull heavy metal uh, 10G win. That's what that big old That's what the big trophy is, dude. Is. Yep. That, how much does that thing weigh? It's heavy. Is it all cement? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's made out of cement, buds. I think it's made out of, like, it looks like a plaster. I thought you were supposed to call cement cement. You're supposed to call it concrete, actually, technically. Oh, That's shit. the other thing. Well, it's a whole other topic. But anyways, like, is that all Creed or what? Yeah. I, I, they, they, they just made the heaviest trophy. Did you just fly home with that Yeah, thing? the, the actual feature. Overweight. There was three features in that contest. It was mm. at Niagara Falls in the park. Oh, okay. And, like, when they got there, th- someone showed up, a rider showed them, was like, yo, these rails are aluminum. <laughs> and Red Bull was just like, 
I don't care. We'll cut them out. And they cut them out and put in steel. What? And then they cut those out, put back in the aluminum after the contest. That's how Red Bull rolls. But yeah. Burn and budge. There was three sections. Burn some budge, boys. (laughs) (laughs) Cut the rails out. There's three sections, and they modeled the trophies off that. Bozong won the first one. Scotty Arnold won the second. And I won the third. What kind of cheddar bisque? 10 G's. That was like. We going cash? No. It was a check. I got a Polaroid somewhere. I took a photo of the check. check. Dude, congrats. Ripping. How was the overweight bag fee on the way home with that? Yeah. (laughs) Was that like five grand of the 10 G's? (laughs) No, I think they shipped it. That's That's cool. You have that thing. Back to the. I was going to circle back. Yeah, back to the. I don't even remember what the question was. Original question. I never actually got to it, but we had to. We had to. (laughs) Sorry. Figure out if that was semen or concrete. Or, yeah. But luckily, we got to the bottom of that. So, um, but. Going back to your long career, you know, before we started recording last night, we were kind of talking about um, some stuff that maybe people that aren't professional snowboarders don't realize that as pro snowboarders people go through. And, you know, what kind of strain does that career put on you mentally? And, like, what did you struggle with as a pro going like with that type of? I don't know. I mean, definitely filming a video part is hands down – the gnarliest thing that anybody can put themselves through. I have like the utmost respect for every kid and filmer and photographer out there that are like grinding out, trying to like curate a video part and a a film of movie, a photo, whatever it is. It's like, it's exponential work. It's exponential dedication and determination. And it's just crazy. And like, I think like, what I struggled with mostly is, is like, like self-confidence. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm getting like tossed into these video projects and you got these just outlandish pros that are just so good. And, and I never really fully accepted. I think that, you know, like I was a pro or like, you know, yeah, sure. He's like getting paid and stuff and, you know, photos start popping, but I didn't feel like it like I didn't what I thought a pro snowboarder was and as a kid it was just like it was just this thing and you reached it and it was like something that it was just like once you made it there that that like do it was like you're a pro snowboarder and I I didn't ever really grasp that so it was like kind of getting tossed into it I never felt it you know what I mean for real even when you won that 10k I don't know yeah I can't say that there was any like change you know, like, yeah. sure, like, some things were kind of sick, and, like, you're traveling, and you're seeing things, but things are coming so fast, and, like, going into these, like, like, Mac Dog, like, getting into that, like, dude, JP was at his absolute peak. Larger Jer- than life. Oh, Jeremy was just, you know, like, shake down here. He was so determined. I've never, and that's when I really, like, I guess, understood, like, what it was to be a pro. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's not, I mean, as much as it's it's all the homies and everyone's cruising and chilling and vibing and it's just about snowboarding and having fun and everything. But, like, when it's when it's on and there's pressure, you literally have to find something in yourself that you don't know exists to believe in yourself to do something. Yeah. And that was always, like, a, a big struggle that I had, I think. I Just, like, owning it. You know what I mean? I never had, like, this, like, kit. I never had this, like, gimmick or this anything, you know. I was just, like, hard work, determined, you know, I'm going to, if, like, if it takes me 30 tries, it's going to take me 30 tries, and I hope I walk away with it. But a lot of times I didn't, you know what I mean? And you were hanging with the baddest dudes dudes. in the snowboarding. I mean, there's a reason JP and Jeremy got to the level they're at. Yeah, and, and, uh, like, what I've seen in those two from a mental standpoint, Jeremy is like so unwavering in his mental, like in his, in his focus that like he'll do these weird, like, like, uh, you know, when you put the marble on the ball and it's got holes and it's like a maze, Mm. he holds it in one hand and just does it. Really? And he's, he stomps it. Like when you look him dead in the eyes, he's just on you. Yeah. There's no quiver. There's no stutter. There's nothing. Like, he's solid. And, like, that comes from his person and then also his snowboarding 
Like when he was determined to get something, there was nothing that was going to stop. He's going to get it. Yeah. And he's, he's like, to me, like he's, he's got natural talent, natural style, natural abilities, very like, very easy. And JP, he's a little more, you know, his style is different. And what I saw in JP and what I always like was trying to dissect and figure out was the fact that his mental game is so strong. Like he'll, he probably, I can only assume, but like he'll go through his tricks. Like when he gets a trick in his head, worked out in his head, it is in there forever the double cork dude he was probably working on that trick every night before he went to bed for how many years it lined up he did it he put it down i watched him do i was there yeah and it was insane we lost our marbles for five minutes in the backcountry i bet i was there when he did it again and he did it like third try again again and he never had done it he wasn't out practicing. He wasn't out there training. He was just like, I think I got this. And yeah. then when he did it, he did it. Same with, like, all his rail moves. It's like once he locked it in his brain, it was over. Well, and I struggled with that. I struggled hard with that because, like. And you're with these two dudes. Oh, dude. I mean, and, like, the bisque for them was, like. Incredible. Insane Unlimited as far as, like, bisque. travel bisque yeah. and, like, whatever. Like, dude, I was just, you know, getting in and, and coming, like, like. When I started filming, I was on Capita. And I wasn't getting paid like I blew was paying me like eight hundred bucks a month, and that was flat. And I was like, okay, sick. I got to film this video part. These dudes are just <laughs> like eight hundred bucks is a flight. Like they like if they're like, oh no, I go I fly direct. Yeah, and I'm just like, they're not looking for the cheapest flight. They're never. looking for so, the most comfortable. So keeping up with that was a struggle in itself. You know that wasn't that was gnarly. That that's what. It made me, you know, I had to make decisions like, all right, if I want to play in this, like, arena, I got to, like, figure out some ways to, like, fund this thing because it's not happening. These guys are, like, unlimited. I'm going to get a good dinner after I just get this sick clip and I'm staying in a nice hotel and I'm taking a direct flight and we're getting a sick <laughs> rental car. You know, it's not like. They're baking And we might best. ship a winch. And well, yeah, that, came, that came later yeah, for later. sure. But, yeah, I mean, Jeez. that's that's, like, the struggles, you know. Was a young kid, and I got mad props and respect for everyone out there doing it because it's like, it's like, it's an attribute that like very few people hold and can hold on to and can pull it off to, consistently. To, to connect the dots from an earlier conversation, we were talking about the MJ documentary, and uh, some people might crucify me for this, but in my head, if I was to make a comparison of who is the MJ of snowboarding, to me, it's JP Walker. And I don't know if that's a that's a stretch, but that that's kind of, and like the way the the mentality you're describing closely resembles the MJ mentality. Like they're both just that laser focus, you know. Oh yeah, laser yeah. focus and like determined and nothing stopping them. And like they're not giving anybody like handouts, you know. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to like they make you earn mm -hmm. everything. Like everything was earned back then, you know what I mean? Because it's like, I mean, imagine. Like, JP was a product of, like, the biggest marketing machine in snowboard history. Yes. The Forum 8. And still yeah. is. Yeah. That and, still and, is, like, and, the biggest. And every single company, every single other rider, every single thing was jocking what he was doing and what they wanted a piece of him. They wanted a piece of his, like, they just wanted to bite it. So what do you think that does to a guy? Like, yeah. he's just like, dude, I'm doing me. Everyone's trying to bite it, like, and, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, everyone could do their own math. I That's guess, a but. confidence booster. That's for damn but, sure. I mean, I don't know if it's so much a confidence booster in the fact that, yes, I agree, but at the same time, he's like, he's got to, they got to weed through that to like be able to put down what they want to put down yeah. and, and keep, keep it, keep it true to them. You true. know, that's got to so. be a challenge. Another thing, thinking about all <laughs> these big projects and the situation you were in, did you ever feel like your pressure, like, did you, did you, put a ton of pressure on yourself and ever struggle with that dude i was the the amount of pressure i put on myself is every every season every trick every spot everything i had so much pressure it was crazy it was, it was like super hard to deal with at times i actually didn't really process the amount of pressure that you know film and video parts put on me until i 
you know, phased out. And I woke up one day and I was like, dude, I didn't have that dream. And I didn't even really put the, put the pieces together while I was in the game. I had a reoccurring dream for 10 years. And it was gnarly. It was like there was, it, it, I mean, I can tell you exactly what it is because every single night, it wasn't the exact same scenario, but it was me getting chased by an unseeable thing that was a massive monster with fangs and trying to get me. And I had to like go through this crazy obstacle course and do all this thing. And I would do a thousand laps of that dream every night in my head at that thing nipping at my heels is something I never saw. The obstacle course you were snowboarding or no, run, no running, no walking, yeah, just doing whatever. I don't know. Yeah. You, you know, it's a dream. But you, you know had I mean? this dream every single night, dude. Okay. And then until I was done, like filming, and like the pressure was off myself, and like everything, and I woke up and I was just like, "Dang, like that, that put." Effect. That's what's wild. the psychological analysis of this dream? Let's talk. Let's get. Yeah, did let's you ever? In did you ever Google let's, it? Because a lot of times you can Google probably, dreams. Well, a, a okay. well, there is. A I've Googled certain you. dreams. Here, and they, here's what I wet dreams. Yeah. I'm sorry. Here's I what I put. Too. Here's what I put in my head, and it came to it came kind of towards the end of the career. And I was talking with uh, Jeremy, JP, and Joe and Simone. We were on the the Cheers, and it was like the 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 thought was like as soon. As the premiere hits and it's a party, everyone's hanging out, everyone's having a rager, you just got a part, you're super stoked, everyone's juiced. You wake up that next morning, you have zero shots. You have nothing in the bag anymore. Wow. And from that point forward until that next per- premiere, it's a full-blown, all-out mission. Do whatever it takes to get the sickest thing ever and you got to top yourself, you got to make it better than before you have to like keep going and go to the reaches and find things in yourself that you've never didn't even think was there wow wild (laughs) the insatiable drive of a clip addict right there yeah that is but i never thought that you guys woke up day after premiere like oh my god i gotta get my next video part that was it that was it yeah i mean it's on you maybe you chilled for the summer and then stressed when the snow flies I mean, videos are dropping, well, like the end of September, October, yeah. and then it's like you're going into the year and you have no shots, and that's wow. a huge, uh, yeah. that's a big reality. Like, for yeah, someone so that's that, when it starts, right, because the season's starting. The summer, you're chilling, dude. Yeah, you summer, you're chilling. You got part. shots in the bag. Chilling. As long that's, as you got a part, you're chilling. Yeah, and not stressing. And if you didn't, you're freaking out because you don't freaking. have a part. You know what's kind of cool? Uh, J.P. Walker told me, he's like, if I could go back to, like, the best feeling in the world to him, He's like, it's the summer in between, like, when you filmed your best video part and when your part comes out. He's like, if I could just, like, live in that space, that su- knowing that, zone that you in have between. heat dropping, that was, like, his, that's his, like, it's a crazy, I never All thought about All is that. well, yeah, yeah, like, everything's great, that, shots are in the bag. When it's out, it's I'm over. It's yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're sitting on wow. heat, that's yeah. what. That is cool yeah. to think about. Damn, I never thought about that. Yeah, I never thought about it like that, and that's really insightful and pretty and, cool. And tie it back to that dream, it's that never-ending chase. And, yeah. and maybe for me, it was chasing me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, And I was doing whatever it took to like get through and keep going. Yeah, and whatever it, it takes an, you to get never over that cycle. obstacle. I think I filmed like, like 11 or 12 video parts or like 10 solid ones at least That's a lot to put down yeah and then year after year and like didn't take i didn't take many risks with like throughout that with like mixing up crews whereas like now the wisdom sets in and i'm 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 older and i'm like damn i should have like taken that trip to that place and just total taking a risk it's not that i have any regrets like, yeah at any but it, but it's like the wisdom you gain everyone will get it and and that like you know, I never, I never did that because, like, like especially back in the Mac Dog days, it, dude, you don't give up that spot. No, you got no, that. There spot. was, it's there yours. was, two hundred riders wanting that spot. Yeah, so if you got hungry, that spot. Hungry hippos. Right? You're, yeah, you're, you're in it. You're in it. Well, while we're still talking in your career, I got a Patreon question. Hit it. I kind of, I don't want to get past your career into your next life until this question kind of fits in. It's from Tommy J. Shouts, let's give him a gunshot. Shouts to Tommy J. He says it would be dope to hear a little bit about the early days at Capita and the 
transition into Santa Cruz? Because that was making a change for you. Yeah, it's... Changing sponsors. It's a bit of a sore spot for sure. It's you a know? sore spot. Yeah, it sucks. Like, I I was, you know, getting that call from Blue, like the whole Capita going to the factory, doing the whole thing, you know, and he gave me a model and everything. and But then also, like, as the Mac Dog and, like, that whole thing like I'm telling you about, that was as far as, like, you, you know, needing to fund my winter and do these certain things and like capitas in these like early beginning stages. Like I'm breaking the bank of blue getting 800 bucks a month. Yeah, they didn't have money back then. No. And I felt so bad and I knew it was struggling and everything was a struggle. Any business, any business is in that, in in that. And at that time and, you know, and then I kind of got pressured from, you know, outside sources to, to make a decision and yeah, man, it didn't, it didn't go down like the way I wanted because I would probably be at, like not. I mean, I'm like with Volcom and I'm like more hyped than I've ever been. But I would probably be with Capita because I'm just like a, a loyal person as far as like as far as like you know like what I ride. Yeah. You know? if, if I don't you know work there or anything, but it, like yeah, Capita was like I was like family. That was. That never would have quavered, and then, but you know, going into Santa Cruz, it, you know. That was cool too. That was really, dude. Santa Cruz Let's talk was bisque. sick. Let's talk about the bisque too. I'll straight up tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. That's what we like to hear. Yeah, let's hear about what the bisque. Was no, I got like. first year when I signed with uh, Santa Cruz is like three grand a month, and then it went up. It just kept jacking up, and I signed a three year deal maybe, and then I think I got one another one year before it went down, I mean, but so it went up. It probably you basically went had like, to leave Capita so you could get this money to keep up with the other guys. Oh, dude, I got like a ten thousand dollar travel budget. I got like yeah. uh, like, and mind you, I got other travel budgets, but I blew that so far and beyond that I was spending over probably thirty five to forty k a year Ooh. filming. That's, is you know that the most that? you've ever spent in a year? I don't. I don't Filming. even. I don't even want to know, and I didn't care. It wasn't. I didn't have a travel budget. Unlimited. No. Oh. It was what I got paid. Yeah. It was like it all went into everything. I it was snowboarding. I got whatever. I didn't care. I was like, whatever it takes. I don't care. It, it, what, this this flight cost me three grand. I'm buying it. That's a lot you know, to you know spend in a that? season. We call that burning some budge. Burning some budge. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it was like, dot com. <laughs> it was a reinvestment, you know, it wasn't like, yeah. it, it was a total reinvestment. I was going right back into like, I, I don't care. Like I'm filming video parts. This is one time in my life that I'm doing it and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. I so no regrets, really. No, no, no. You never. needed that money. Yeah, to, yeah, to play ball on the Mac dog field. Totally. Totally. And, and maybe it would have got there and blue did put together a good counter offer, but. It, uh, so that's, he tried. That's, that's sick. He definitely, dude. Yeah. He's, Blue's amazing. Like Blue's he's, I got nothing shit. but love for him. Like forever. You My know? years I, I living with so, him are good yeah. memories. I felt so bad. You know, it sucked. It was yeah. harsh. I was like going through some shit. You know, but, as a brand though, you, it's a good lesson for Blue because it's gonna happen. Yeah. There's. I mean, you work at Volcom. You know, yeah. writers are gonna come. They're gonna go. And dude, we part were, of the process. We were homies, and he saw someone come between us and. And I'm sure that hurt even more. It hurt me. It just sucked. Yeah. It sucked. But, and the end, Santa Cruz was cool. Like, skate brand. Santa, like, I went, I, I was kind of like, Santa Cruz, really? Like, and then I actually, like, went to Santa Cruz, to the factory. It's a cool vibe. And, huh? like, walking around, like, you know, because it's, it's NHS, they own Indie and Creature and um, all these, like, rad brands. And, like, I was, like, looking on the walls, and there's just so much history, just skateboards after skateboards and, like, so much rad, like, Jim Phillips art, everything, everywhere. And I was, like, I went out of there, and I was, like, Santa Cruz is sick. Yeah. Let's do this. And, and did it, you know? And we made some cool boards. Cooley got on the program, and it was, like, joining up with, like, Stephen Duke and Curtis Woodman and all those guys. And, like, it was rad. And uh, I'm, you know, super fortunate for it. And, you know, just, that, it's just how it goes. It's like, yeah. it's, like, the one that gets away. And, and you know, in Volcom, like, I didn't care whatever. Like, I had a couple of other offers, like, head-to-toe offers. And I was like, no. Like, like tr- someone tried to give me an entertainer. I was like, Never. Like really, Volcom is. You like, were like, I'm sticking. Dude, with I was Volcom. hooked. I was hooked on that brand when they launched in '91. Like my yeah. friend had a T-shirt. I was a fan. I was like, that is the sickest 
the Volcom Stone is the sickest logo of all time, and like, like I am in, and like to be able to ride for him, like hundred percent dream come true. Like Blue hooked that up too because he, he knew um, Jay Twitty. Mm, I had, Twitty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, he's like, "Who do you want to ride for?" And I'm like, "Cause when I got on Capita, I'm like Volcom, DC, and Dragon." And he just locked it. Locked all. them all up. <laughs> so cool. Can you get a bubs, dog? Yeah. Dude, so, that is awesome. Here. Yeah. Good looking out blue, too. That's really cool. Yeah. No, he's he's great. Well, we, we've talked. And yeah. He's all. That's all good. Yeah. All, yeah. Blue's the man. Yeah. To um, keep kind of connecting some of the dots of this conversation, I was thinking about your pressure and, you know, that pressure you put on yourself and how – you know, that reoccurring nightmare, basically, that's that you're crazy, going through. Dude. That's a really cool up. story. <laughs> but now I see you snowboard, and it's like you fell in love with snowboarding. Do you feel like now that you snowboard on your own terms, like you, you fell back in love with it in a different type of way? Because I see you on a powder day just getting it. You're there. Oh, uh, I never didn't love snowboarding. Some dudes will go through. I've, I've seen a lot of dudes in the game, and they, 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 they love snowboarding. They're a 14-year-old kid. They're so juiced. They get sponsored. They start filming video parts, and they hate it. They punch themselves in the heads, and they're just not stoked. And then they kick out of snowboarding, and they're done, and they, they walk away. Like, I, no matter what, the, the one thing that got me right after a gnarly film trip, a long week in cold Minnesota or wherever it was, and you're just putting yourself through hell, was Brighton. Every time, dude, the day I would get home, I would go ride Brighton, solo, whatever, I don't care. Like, four runs there puts my head completely right. And, like, to, to kind of give everyone, like, a, you know, when, it, when, when I started transitioning out, you know, I, I got, uh, like, uh, handed an opportunity to expand my role with Volcom, you know. And it was, like, Billy Anderson, you know. Obviously, like, I've always been curious about, photography video editing like my sponsor me tape i edited it like i had to figure it out like how to film and edit and like homies filmed it and like we edited it so i've always been curious about that and i've always like loved photography and filming and they kind of knew that and they understood it and then they knew like like what they you know as far as like my work ethic goes like driven 100 percent. like i turned down like how many sponsor team trips because i'm like no video part nope yeah, like, um, like you want to go to Japan? We're gonna go shred and do this, and it'd be sick. I'm like, nope, video part. I'm filming. Sorry, that's all there. Like, is, they, yeah. they would, they would be so bummed, <laughs> like different sponsors. You know what I mean? But um, but yeah. So they they offered me like you know like this team captain role, and it was more like for lack of better terms, like I can't even compare it to anything like this. But for lack of better terms, it was like at the time, and they were like, yeah, like it's kind of like how Jamie Thomas will go on a trip. And he still gets a clip, but he's also getting second angle and he's like helping line up the trip and making sure all the kids are like, you know, getting clips. Yeah. They, they needed they needed someone to to really help drive, you know, where a team manager couldn't. Yeah. And because and you're with them. Boots on yeah. the ground too. Boots on the ground. Yeah, but they needed boots on the ground. This brings us to our guest question. Our guest question is actually presented by Solomon Snowboards. They support myself. They support Stony Buds. They also support the bomb hole. And in case you guys are wondering, I ride the Solomon Six Piece with the Shadow Fit bindings. Best setup, in my opinion. Buds, what are you rocking out there? Dude, I actually rock a Six Piece. He rocks the Six Piece. <laughs> I also ride one of those uh, those volley. Okay. Setups the. Uh, What's his Asmo collab? Oh yeah, the Asmo. Woo! Collab. Your board and that board together. Hammer that time. Gunshot. Okay, let's, Hammer time. let's get into the guest question presented by Solomon from none other than Jeremy Jones. Love the show, you guys. Thanks for uh, letting me call in to ask Mr. Seth Hewitt, who's in the hot seat. A hot question, Seth. <laughs> Volcom's always had your back. I think they always will, and. Thank you, Volcom, for that. You decided you weren't going to snowboard professionally any longer. And at that time, you kind of rolled into Volcom brand guy. I know that they would have had your back either way. So what was the switch to decide to kind of peel out of filming and doing your thing as a pro shred? And the second part of that is 
what was that transition like? Wow, that's a good question. That's kind of what we were leading into. Um, yeah, Jeremy. Thanks, dude. Um, yeah, so I guess like what the transition was like, you know, going over, like I was saying, it was like, it was kind of tough, you know, it's kind of like, oh, this is weird, you know, like I got kind of handed this like opportunity and it was kind of more like, hey, there's val- they, they saw some value in, in there, in me. And, and I was stoked on that. And I was super stoked because like along with like pro snowboarding, well, I think what drives people like that, like the snowboard or pro snowboarders is not only the actual act of snowboarding, but it's the progression. It's like, it's expanding and doing something that maybe is like a little bit out of your comfort zone, but then at the same time that y- you, you get better at and you can get feedback from and you just want to get better. So when, when this opportunity kind of arised, it was kind of, it kind of came like at a weird time because I get the call <laughs> for, a, you know, had that conversation literally a week later, everything happens in a week, <laughs> but uh, I get the call from Gunny, Chris Gunnerson, and, um, and he says, Hey, we're going to start this new thing and it's called real snow and it's filming a minute video part that is going to be featured on X games and it's going to be judged and you can win 75 K. And I was like, Oh, that's good. I was like, yeah, those early years of the street real snow. Yeah. And I was like, damn. Okay. And that concept, like now real snow is like a full blown formula. It's like, you know, it's like here it is, but we had, and you had to have your video part done, finished, polished by January 1st. So, I mean, dude, you have one month. You know, and a th- like, like there isn't really too much snow going down before Thanksgiving anywhere, and in, yeah. in the world much, you know, and then and then you know, like you have a month, like it's December and up until Christmas break. So um, that kind of that opportunity came, and so it was like weird. It was like I was like, dang, dude, like, and then and then and then Volcom came back to me. I was like, yo, we know what's going on. We, we totally here. Here's like some you know travel budget and a production budget go do that. This will start after sick. So I was like, okay, cool. But it was still kind of like, it was still kind of one of those weird pressure things where I was like, Oh no, this is like, Oh, uh, this is it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, this is it. It was kind of, kind of exciting, but it was kind of like crazy. So, you know, did the whole real snow thing. And, and I really put my heart and soul into that part and, 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 you know, had like a great time, filming it with the homies we took a group approach to it we were just like you know what like yeah we're competing against each other but let's just crew up and just do this and like everyone like we're we're adults we're homies like we'll we'll, i want to be there and shovel for you so you can win 75k because i know i'm not you know (laughs) that's that was the approach we all took and and the main goal of that thing for us was like let's make street snowboarding look as good as we possibly can for the public like for the general public that doesn't that all they know is x games so it was an opportunity so that was that and after that you know i took a long like it was kind of like i was done and i was like they're like yeah like that's yeah yeah and i was like shit <laughs> so i took like long super hikes in the backcountry of brighton and like just had like these like full-blown like meditations out there just like self-reflecting and and I, and I, and I, I just like answered my question. I was like, no, dude, I love snowboarding and will always snowboard. And this pro career doesn't mean anything. And I went on and I filmed a little like GoPro part at Brighton, just like on, on, whenever I had it, I didn't even do it. And that year it snowed every single day for like all of March, all of April. It was the most insane spring. And I was just sitting there laughing, riding solo hitting everything I ever wanted to hit (laughs) and just, it was like the perfect capper. And then, you know, going into that, you know, like I just, then it just, it started to snowball as far as my like transition out, you know, it was like social media, like doing, you know, Volcom snow Instagram and, and, and doing like all sorts of more stuff, photos and filming. And like all of a sudden I was getting more filmer opportunities. And I just was like mentally. And I told Billy and Ryan boys, like my, you know, team managers at Volcom at the time, I was like, once this switch flips, it's, it's not going back. 
So I had to, I had to like consciously make that choice. And I was like, I flipped it. And I was like, cool. Like, I love filming. I love taking photos. I have no idea, even to this day, if what I create is good or not. But I don't care. <laughs> I just want to do it, you know, and I want to do it for the team. And I want to do it for snowboarding. And I just want to keep doing it. So it was just like I switched the flip in my head or flipped the switch in my head and went full steam into it and, like, learn every day. I'm still learning stuff. And it's incredible. And, like, transitioning into, like, an industry position, you know, where it's, like, I'm, you know, like, you know, as things went on, like, R Ryan Immigart, like, the CMO is, like, you know, Volcom's very first snowboarder. He gets it. And 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 he's believed in me all this time and, and has put me in these, like, big roles and these big decisions. And I have, like, the utmost respect and, like, you know, the, you know, thankfulness for that and 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 you know I'm, I'm here i'm here i told him i was like dude i'll give you my dying breath i'm here until it's you know until you don't want me here anymore or until <laughs> there's no more so <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> until the wheels fall off yeah it, i mean it really is like it's like yeah like you know like i i'm emotional as far as like the connections that i got to the people that you know, I work with and, and want to be around and, and the brand, you know, like the stone, I look on it. Every time I put a stone sticker on my board, dude, I still get that feeling. It's yeah. sick. I, when I lace up new gear, like that jacket back there, like when I put that on for the first time, that's like a throwback jacket. It still feels so good to just represent the stone. And I love it. But you know, it's a crazy thought on that level is that it, a brand is who works for it or who who works for the company? A brand isn't what, it's who. Like, it, it's, it, I feel like, in my opinion, um, you know, the minute it gets bought by, like, Walmart or and it's controlled by somebody else, it's not the same. It would lose that if it wasn't how it is now. Yeah. And yeah, and, like, and like now I'm, like, managing the team more and, and you know, and I got to have hard conversations with them, and it sucks. And that's life with it a sucks. brand. But, dude, I truly care about, every single person on that squad and like, like deeply care, you know, like I, and, and I want to do them right. And like, I just, I want to do the brand right. And I want to do, you know, snowboarding right. And it's like, and that's what really drives me. That's, that's, that's the transition. It's just understanding that, you know, you know, it's, I don't know, selflessly, but, but I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know. I just, I can't really explain it. I just, I, I'm just down. Dude, yeah. I'm down for this for sure. So. I'm I don't get that hyped on a lot of brands, man. But I'm like a kid when it comes to Volcom too, man. You've you've had my back, and only a couple brands really have. And Solomon, Volcom, it's fucking dope. It's like they make you feel like family. Yeah, and and, and that's I, cool. I, I mean, there's I'm I'm not saying there's no other brands out there. There's probably a lot of brands out there that people like have the same connection with. But for me, it's like it's yeah. always been Volcom. It's hard like, to get that same feeling when yeah. you put on something else. Yeah, and, like, expanding Stuff. my role and becoming an employee was, like, so huge because, sure, I knew, uh, I knew uh, like, a lot of people. But when, I, when you actually go in and you see, like, I knew a lot of people in marketing and, and, and everything, you know, just, like, team managers and whatnot and team parties and, like, the premieres and stuff like that. But when you actually go in and you're in the office and you see the graphic designers and the creative directors and – you know, and the, the outerwear designers, the streetwear designers, like all the way down to like, you know, the coordinators, everyone is just so they love their jobs. And it's so inspirational and motivating to like be a part of such an awesome team that like wants to do cool stuff always. And you and you it's a whole new respect. And kind of as a second parallel to that. It's like after filming all these video parts and starting to film and edit and like really like working for someone else, I respect the people that did that for me more now. You yeah. know, like all the like filmers like Mac Dog and, and Pierre and Justin Eels and Corey Kaniniak, all the dudes like behind the lens, Ross Steffi. How many times did I call Ross Steffi out of Oregon to like come film a clip and like <laughs> not land? You know what I mean? Like there's a lot like – like the dudes behind the lens are, you know, they're so important, and you know, their their role in all of this is like it's huge, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like and you're behind the lens, yeah, too. yeah. And this is another yeah. interesting concept too, because 
we filmed together when you were working on Mr. Plant. And I remember I landed a line in Minnesota at a school and you were more fucking hyped than I was. Like, I was just like, okay. And you're like, how the fuck do you keep that hype after all these years going? I'm filming Chris Grenier. Like, <laughs> no, dude. Like, I, I, getting a shot, like, when you film a sick shot or you get a sick photo, you guys both know the feeling and you land something. And from a writer's perspective, there's no better feeling when it just lines up and, you don't even have to look at the clip. I love when I'm filming something and I don't even have to look and I'm, yeah, and I, that's you know. gold. You yeah. were great. I was great. Let's take that one to the part. Yep. Gives you, you know? a feeling. It yeah, I like, mean, like, and dude, that that year, like, Mr. we were filming for Mr. Plant. Um, Pat invited Grenier on the sesh because we were both in Minnesota. His, you were filming VG? Yeah, I was filming for video. Yeah. And um, your part in Get Real to edward sharp magnetic zeros is like damn dude like that was such a heater track and like edited so well writing in and i remember that and i was just like i want to do you justice like i don't want to film something shitty of you and and like you're not stoked you know what i mean because mm -hmm. like so i'm there and i'm like in it i'm 100 percent focused we're filming like it's a line and like i was filming chris at washington elementary and Minnesota, yeah, you did, what, 50-50 back three land backflip. That's insane. And it was so cool and, like, pushed the lens into some, I don't know what we did. But I was juiced. I was so it juiced. It working that, together on the line. Yeah. yeah. Summers two get people. clip high, too, man. Yeah, that's, that's a clip high. Oh, yes. dude. Rav. Rav. He'll give you clip That high. season. <laughs> I mean, always. I love yeah. filming Rav. And that year, it was like Pat was on this – crazy determined mission and we were all in it was like eight hour builds <laughs> we're getting yeah. up early and we're he's going massive he hits it three times it's done but it was two two days and it was insane and we're like yes and then it was rav was up and i would dude i would just get like this whole like reset and it was like everyone would just kind of go do their thing because rav his 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 uh feature selection is just incredible yeah and being able to film pat and rav in the same day or on the same trip was just such a uh, like a like an awesome contrast because like Rav I I would just sit there we go to a spot and he's like looking around and he doesn't like the shovel he's just kind of patting some stuff kind of throwing some stuff with the nose of his board and he's like looking at some stuff and I'm just sitting there just like I cannot wait to find out what he's got <laughs> to find <laughs> and there's this one clip in Mr. Plant I don't I think I made the video it definitely made true to this like but he he. Does a frontside 180 over this block, lands, does a Sonic the Hedgehog roll, switch, gets <laughs> back up, switch front boards, this little curved rail, and I was just losing my mind. That was like, ah, uh, like, you know what I mean? It's so like, good. It's like yin and yang. You yeah. got Pat going huge. Yeah. You got Rav doing his Bookends, own. Bookends, basically. Totally, yeah. And that year was crazy, too, because, like, um, you know, Pat's filming for Mr. Plant. I was like, yeah, dude, like, you know, Jake Price directed and it was, it was his, uh, you know, his video and I was super stoked to be involved and help Pat film. But Jake broke, broke his collarbone, Dirks and Derby, like December, what, first? And he's out. Uh, so I got another Patreon question from uh, Sean Fitzpatrick. He wants to know about your trail riding. He digs and rides trails up in Washington, and he gets stoked that one of his favorite old pros does the same. And he also wants to know what you like better now, filming or hitting spots and snowboarding, but he wants to hear about that trail riding because he's, he's similar. Well, shouts to Sean for calling it trails because that's like the biggest um, determining factor if you're calling them dirt jumps or you're calling them trails like the locs call them trails oh i call them dirt jumps yeah that's a, that's a fun <laughs> little fact I, I did not know that you probably would have called yeah. them dirt jumps. no uh, yeah i don't know yeah no dude riding riding bmx trails has been like it's really what saved my soul as far as like coming out of pro snowboarding the highs of filming video parts and everything and it just you 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 grow this like monster inside you that just wants to consume you know and once that starts to stop, like, I kind of went through some, like, I'll straight up say it. I went through, like, crazy, weird depressions that just were just like, what, who am I? What am I doing? You know, just a lot of questioning. And I take my kid to the, the dirt jumps because those are dirt jumps. Yeah. They're not trails. I yeah. take him there and I, and I discover this whole new, like, thing. And 
I just started. I just was like, all right, I'm going to do this from the ground up. And being able to take everything that I ever learned snowboarding and how to like progress and being able to apply that into something brand new and fresh, like, like the air awareness, like when you get up in the air and you look at the backside of one of those jumps and you're not used to looking at off 60 foot cliffs, you're going to be terrified and you're probably, it's going to suck. But taking everything I've known from snowboarding, air awareness, the feelings, dude, it was like drag and click translation, copy paste. All I had to do was learn how to ride and jump a bike. You knew the key commands. Key commands. The shortcuts, they call it. <laughs> yeah. you had a couple yeah. shortcuts. Final cut, shortcuts, all day long. And it was just, and that, that was it. And that pulled me out of like this like hole of just something that was like, and I didn't understand it. And I was like talking with um, somebody and they're just like, you're, you're like addicted to the focus. And I'm like, y- you're absolutely right. Cause like when you're, when you're ripping back on a lip and you're just up over the jump, you're not thinking about anything, but how sick this perspective is. And you're looking down in the cavern of a, backside and you're just like yep and you just keep going and it's just the next one you're flying 90 miles an hour through the woods with your homies laughing in trains and it's like i can't explain it i the can't trains are crazy i yeah. cannot believe more snowboarders do not be in yeah, it sounds because, like you're getting that dopamine hit like you used to back in the day and that's what you were missing and yeah to get depressed i mean i think a lot of snowboarders go through that when they i mean what's you what's gonna what's gonna What's your come down? Like, Grenya, you're going to go through it. <laughs> like, what's, what's your come down from front boarding triple kinks? How do you, you don't just not want to do that anymore, but you I'll understand. Yeah, there you go. You got to find those out. But avenues. you got to find it or else that depression yeah. can get serious, yeah. man. Like, and you got to find, and you can start from the ground up. And that was, that was an epic feeling. So that helped the, tr- the transition out. Like, well, that was clean. That's cool. Circling back around from the guest question from Jeremy Jones, what I wanted to know was what effect did that avalanche with Jeremy have on you? And can you kind of take us through that day? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I was there. Like I was there. Like that was a, that was a crazy day. Um, it was definitely like something I've been processing for quite a long time, you know, it was, um, I, Jeremy hits me up. He's like doing some stuff with the destroyer and he hits me up and he's like, Hey, do you want to go on this uh, catboarding trip? And I was like, I don't know. It was like, it was like January. I think it was January 9th. I want to say. And then when he asked me again, like the day before, and I was just like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like your super good homie asks you to go catboarding. You go like, you're not a snowboarder if you don't go. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. But, you know, and this, when he says catboarding, I'm thinking, yeah, I've been to bald face. I know what catboarding is. Hell yeah, it's going to be sick. And we're going up to a zone in the UN as I've never been, don't know anything about. But Jeremy's asking me, and I'm like, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, of course. I'll, yeah, let's do it. Okay. So we show up six more, like 6 a.m. where he picks me up, we're riding up, and he's like, hey, just so you know, it's kind of like a little bit of a loose operation. I just took my essentials. Like I had my, you know, Gore-Tex Volcom kit. I had the uh, prototype vest we were testing out and I just had like bare essentials. Like, but it was like, cool. And I was like, okay, we show up and I see the, there's like this little cat kind of beat up on this trailer. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, two dudes standing there. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Cowboy. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. So then um, we meet up the crew. It's like T-Bird, Mary, Alex, Garrett, like Alex Andrews, Garrett, um, Millward, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, my friend Brock, my super good friend, like best homie forever, Brock, and then his Brock Harris. Yep. Yeah, his homie Gordon, and then the two like, and Mike Nelson who owns, um, Destroyer, and then the two like dudes guides or dudes, you know, cat guys. So, show up. We go. We start cruising up this uh, zone in the Uinas. And, um, you know, we, we were like, okay, cool. You know, did the whole thing. Like right away, they like pull out this thing and they're like, Hey, just so you know, like we're not like a cat operation. So, you know, if anything goes down, we're just like a group of homies doing this. And I'm like, all right, like 
sketchy, whatever, sign the paper, cool. And I'm just like, so like mentally kind of things are going off, you know. I'm just like, all right, I'm on my toes already. I'm on my toes. I haven't even left the parking lot. Not even. We get up, we cruise up, and um, we get to this zone. It was like Smith and Morehouse Reservoir. And there's this like little like bathroom zone. Get out. Everyone's doing the beacon check. You know, Gordon had never been in the backcountry before. Mary, she had like little, little experience. You know, T-Bird's new, but he, you know, he's solid. He's yeah. definitely solid. A lot of us knew, but there was a couple like things. So we go through the whole Abbey thing. Everyone beacon check. Everyone's on. Everything's good. You know, okay, I'm like feeling a little better. All right, cool. And then um, keep cruising, dude. And it's just hammering snow. We're getting up the road. It's kind of wild. The cat's taking forever. Dude, there's trees down. We're, like, cutting stuff out. And, like, it's, like, it's a heavy day. It's, like, okay, cool. And everyone's, like, yeah, we're just going to keep it chill. Like, yeah. And I'm, like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, like, you know, we finally get up there. We finally get up to, the, like, the last meadow. And this um, this cat is just going, like, mile an hour, dude. It's, like, just creeping. And I'm, like, dude, I could literally get out and post hole this thing faster because <laughs> it's on basically flat ground too and i'm like something's up with this thing okay cool and everyone's just chilling we're, we're having you know just good combos and the cat it's like noon before we even get to the top for the first run so we take the first run and it's it's like we go into the we go in, in the first run we're just like get deep into the trees we're like in like aspens and pretty kind of low elevation definitely low angle but, like, I did this weird, I, like, dropped in, and I rode 10 feet, did this weird thing, got, like, sideways with this tree, did a tumble. And I'm like, oh, that was weird. Okay, whatever. Go down, we go to this, like, little meeting spot. And where is everybody? You know, it was obviously a couple of us that know how, you know, like, how, how it is. It's like this, you, you, like, follow the track, you meet up, and people are kind of shooting out a little bit low people are kind of you know it's like okay cool like all right i'm starting to get the feel like okay cool we're, we're keeping it mellow you know did a little regroup we go down after the first run and we find like a, a little road gap and we're like okay cool let's like hit this so i take off my my vest and it was a prototype vest and i got this new shovel and it was like a real like thin low profile shovel with a t-handle and um I, I go to get my shovel out to like pat down this little like kicker. And I was like, dude, my, where's my shovel handle? It's gone. Like, where is it? And I had the blade and it, what in the, on the prototype, it, it like it, the T handle, usually I run a D handle shovel and it clicks through there mm -hmm. and it's all gravy. Well, it, it's moved to the side and it, the, the shovel handle flew out and wow. was gone. And I was like, dude, wow, I'm out here, heavy day, no shovel. And I was like, mental note, right now, if anything goes down, I grab my shovel blade and I'm like going at just with my shovel blade, two hands on my knees. I can, you know, I can like, I just, I just mentally noted that. We sesh the little, uh, the little step down. It's all good. And we're like, okay, go up for another one. And, and dude, the cat was just struggling, dude. This thing was like not in good shape. And we get to the top and they're like, yeah, this is going to be it. Like, you know, this, this, we're not going to do another one. We're going to go. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, just like, yeah, okay, cool. And we get to this, like this slope and it's like, okay, um, don't, don't mess with that. You know, we're going to go over here. We're going to ride to the side and, and we're going to ride down. And everyone did. And there was a couple little, like, splashes. I think someone kind of splashed it to just to see what was going on. And, you know, we rode down, and some people got, found some, like, rocks and kind of some treed zones, and they are just, like, looking at it and, like, like okay, cool. Because, like, the whole idea was try to get a little bit of content. And then I make it down to the road. Jeremy's down there. No one's down there. And I was the last to drop. I was like, okay, I'm like, I, you know, me and Jeremy know this mo the most here. The, the two dudes that own the cat, it's just like, no, nah, the, the, they, you know, they kind of teed that up that they were just the cat drivers. So yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Um, I get down there first. I'm like, where is everybody? Like, you got to get down to the road. And then and we get down to the road. Everything came down. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, we found this, like, 
like thing to jump off of in the in, kind of in the trees and someone jumped it and it was cool and like whatever so we get down there and then and then they're like let's go for one other one let's go for another one and i was just kind of like okay so we start going up and we're going up again and like back on the first like ascent i'm like sitting there and i'm like <laughs> okay when this thing breaks down do you guys have like a sat phone? Is there anything that, you know, we can, we can call down to get some people on sleds to get us out of here. Cause it was one road up and then, you know, it was just on this road and, uh, and they're all, no, we're totally on our own. There's no cell service up there. None. And I was just like another mental note. I was like, all right, we are out here. We are on our own. Okay, so, and then we go up for that last run, and we get up there, and and Alex is, like, patting out this little, like, rock, and it's, like, okay, cool, like, it's kind of in that zone, you know, like, where it's, like, mm. and I was, like, looking at it, and I was, like, I don't know, and I didn't, I didn't really, like, voice it enough to just be, like, yo, I don't, let's, like, let's just go in the trees, you know, and they're, they're patting it up, and Jeremy's patting it up, and he's, like, teeing it up, and, like, I've seen Jeremy do just incredible things you know like defy the laws of physics and the laws of snowboarding in general and so like i'm i i I trust him a lot i trust him a lot with like what he you know knows and i still do and then everything you know always like dude's solid like i said and um it's like okay you know we got i was like all right well if you know if you guys are hitting this then i'm gonna at least be up at the top I'm going to count you guys in. I was kind of just like, uh, you know, not, not, not too, you know, into it. And then we got, we moved G- uh, Mary down to shoot in a super good spot. She's moved by like a 80 foot tree, super low angle, good spot. Alex goes off this rock and does a backside 90 ragdoll. Just, and it was like, I was, I, I was just like, when I saw him in the air, I like, I counted him in and I like, I was like, oh, holy, okay, it's, okay, here we go, here we go, and he gets up, and he's, like, riding, and, like, just kind of, like, scooting out, and I was just like, oh, wow, wow, like, if backside 90, that's a bomb hole. Yeah, <laughs> that would, that would maybe go under the definition of a, yeah, of a bomb hole in the dictionary. Bomb hole, and then Jeremy's looking, he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go a little bit to the left, and I, like, looked at the landing, I was like, well, there's a landing there for sure. So he's like, okay, cool. And I'm at the top and he just drops in and goes and does like this method, you know, kind of didn't really get it landed. And dude, I was down. I was kind of down counting him in out of the zone. And I heard it. I just heard the most hellacious sound I've ever heard in my life. And I popped up. And I see my homie, his red jacket, in the middle of the gnarliest, deepest, darkest, spider-webbed-out face that I could ever imagine. In the middle. Whoa. And I just started screaming. I'm like, get out of there, Jeremy. You just go, 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 go. Like, you know, get to the side. Like, all the training, everything. Like, everything I'd ever learned. Like, you know, you're just screaming at him. And I'm just sitting there looking. I had, like a balcony view of the whole amphitheater zone. And it was just like, and this slope is about a thousand vertical feet. And it kind of started and then it funneled into this funnel, but the, you know, and the, this runnel that like the drainage and that kind of went into some trees. So it mellowed out quick, but it went over these, the rocks and the, the, the rocks that those guys had jumped off were to the side out of sort of out of it in more in the tree zone and i watched jeremy go over the falls and i fully lost him like like because you know you look you just you don't stop looking yeah and i was waiting for him to shoot out to the left waiting 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 and i was just like freaking and i watched that avalanche like go like two freight trains like that you know you always you see the videos and they that you hear the the stories the and you just you know the snow and the the force and everything and how it works but i have never witnessed a 
force of nature like that and felt it rumbling all the way through my bones. And I watched that thing go two freight trains all the way to the bottom. And and it ended, the whole thing ended on that road. And it kind of, you know, and, and I lost it as it went into the trees and it wasn't, it was taking trees out and it was messing them up and it was knocking trees over, but it wasn't straight mowing the lawn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was going through and I didn't see him. It didn't see him. It didn't see him. And it stopped. It stopped. And I was screaming, Jeremy, Jeremy, you know, like screaming. And I was like, okay, this is on. Like this is 17 years or 20 years or however many years this, this moment it's straight up on. And while I was up on the top and before Alex had jumped off this this cliff, this little rock, I I was up at the top. I noticed this like beautiful spray, like so. And I was like, someone dropped. And I was like, who dropped? No one yelled dropping. No one said anything. And I was over there, so I didn't know there was a there was a group over to the left in the safe zone. And then there was you know the, these guys, and I was helping these guys tee this thing up. But I noticed that that spray, and I know, and I just remembered. I was like, all right, someone's in. I didn't know who. You know, everything was moving super fast. I knew Mary was right there and I knew she was safe. And I, wa- and I, you know, obviously when all the, the avalanche went down, I looked right at her, she was safe. Mm-hmm. And I go, go over and I took like three deep breaths. I was just like, because they, they tell you to do that in the training. It's like, get your shit together. I took three deep breaths, <sighs> strapped in, went down. And I'm like looking and I'm screaming. I'm like, do you see him? Do you have him? Do you have him? And then as soon as I like crested over, as soon as I crested over, I saw his red coat and, and Brock and Alex had moved in at that point. They're all, we got him. We got him. And he was above snow. And I, I rolled up, dude. And he's, he's, he's freaking out. He's above snow. His board is completely clapped around a tree mm. like sideways and i looked and i just you know out of it i noticed his legs were just rubber bands mm. like like the craziest thing everything and i looked at him I, and, and and it just registered he's breathing he's above snow yes he's hurt but i instantly was like where's mike because like when i did the scan mm. i was like where's mike Everyone's just like, where's Mike? Mary, Brock, everyone just like moved in to start helping Jeremy. They're getting him out of his, his bindings, like his, you know, and, and getting him off that tree. He had snow piled up his back. It's like basically his chest is pushed up against the tree. Gnarliest thing you could ever imagine. And, and, and I was just like, where's Mike? And in that decision, I was like, where's Mike? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Because I remember I was like, there's someone in screaming his name screaming his name and then it was like okay like we kind of grouped up right there and it was just like all right i screamed at everybody and and someone said someone had said um i think he went to the road so t-bird's like boom he went to the road to check because he wasn't on the radio can get him on the radio nothing he went to the road to the check and i'm like everybody right now screaming it change your beacons over to search everybody like stop what you're doing change it over just like like screaming like just chaos and all of a sudden boom everyone's popped over i was popped over right away so i was kind of getting a lot of signals and as it as it like everyone popped off then i got one clean signal and i started moving downhill and it's all it's all 20 and then you know how the flux lines work. And then it's all 23. And I was like, okay, I slowed down a bit. Started moving like way, like a little bit slower, waiting for the flux line to catch in. And it's all 30. I stopped. Stopped. Unstrapped. I'm all, he's up there. He's up there. He's up there. All of a sudden, I'm like getting the signal, being super vocal about like the distance, yelling, yelling, yelling. All of a sudden, I, I just looked up. I'm going right into the pack of people around Jeremy. And I just said, stop, everybody, double check your beacon and make sure you are on search. And of course, Jeremy is like, he can't. Yeah, he, he can't, can't have switched think. it. So, and, and everyone was so worried about themselves that they didn't think to like switch it. Like no one would think that. Yeah. And 
They turned his beacon off. The silent went dead cold. And I was just like, and, and within that is all like pretty fast in the chaos, right? And T-Bird had radioed up. He's not at the road. And it was like, all right, Alex and Garrett, just like instantly we were just like, let's go, you know, like down the slide path. And just like every, you know, just like as it is, dude, that slide path, like when I unstrap to like hike up to go into the group, it's like concrete, just like everybody says. And you can run around it like it's asphalt. Going up there, you know, like they start moving down and they're just like going for a signal. I lurched like I'm going, you know what I mean? And then I was like, wait, we don't need three people with beacons right next to each other looking at this. So I did the like, I'm going slow, zigzags the whole slide to see if I can see anything, you know, just like I've always been trained, you know. So I, I, I naturally went to the left because I was kind of close to that edge of the slide path. And, um, and then I, I met the edge and then I went back to the right. And as I was cutting across the slide path, I just started noticing like the severity of this avalanche. This thing was massive and it broke, it double broke off that rock in to like 60 foot trees, like tall trees, massive trees, tons of trees. It was thick. Like it was, a, it would have been a zone that I would have been like, I'm good here. This isn't going to slide. And I'm going in and I'm losing my mind. And I see the crown on the side with the tracks from our first run because like where we had kind of oh, cut wow. back and it was like in the safe zone, like they were, they were in there and I'm looking, I'm just like, Holy shit. This is so big. And as soon as I got to the edge, I looked down and I see a board like base up and I'm looking at my beacon and I'm like, I know he's got a beacon. We checked everything. Like I know I'm so I'm losing. I'm like, freaking out and it was a you know and i'm like i got him i got him i got him i just ripped down there and then i grabbed the board and it's a pow surfer wow oh, shit no one's attached to it because i thought like oh he's just upside down i can dig him out with my with my no handled shovel and it's just a pow surfer and i was like oh it just hit me like a ton of bricks dude mike is in here i have no sigil He's not on a board. I have no idea where he is. And then when you pow surf, you know how you get the like the dog leash that's yeah. like retractable, like 20, Big, 30 feet. Leash. And you put that in your pocket and you zip it. All of a sudden I was like, wait. You start pulling. I was like, wait. I was like, his leash unstrap, walking up. And meanwhile, like, I'm like, through the through all this chaos, right? Like you think that you're going to be this cool, well-oiled machine and every, and you do the training and everything is just like snapping together. No, dude, I was tripping. I was fumbling. I never lost a glove. It was the first time I like Reed had actually um, lent me his BCA tracker. I'm familiar with that beacon. So I was fine with it. And I was in the new Gooch gear and we have like a D ring in the front pocket and, and all the guys at bald face, everyone was telling, you know, like I had gone on two heli trips and a catboarding trip the year before. So I was pretty tuned up as far as like my basic skills, you know, and I've had like avalanche training in, in the, in the past, but I've never done like the full level one. Like Bittner used to line up a sick course for all of us. You've been there yeah. at snowbird with Dean Cardinal, like the main dude for uh, the snowbird ski patrol, his dad, Bittner's dad would line it up. So like, I've gone through many, many years of like, you know, pretty good training, but it's, it's not like I've gone the extra mile to get any certificates or any level ones or anything. So, but anyways, like it was the first year, the first time I've ever put my beacon in my front pocket and it's clipped to a bungee to a D ring that's like attached to the pants and it's safe. And I had the vest on and my jacket's up. My gloves are on. I didn't lose a glove. I don't remember unstrapping. I don't remember taking off my mittens, but I was in and out of my mittens. I was like pulling out my beacon. My beacon's hanging there because it was on a bungee. As I'm pulling this up in this retractable cord, it's I'm walking up the hill and and I'm and I'm I'm like composed. Like I'm not like if I would have had my beacon on my chest, I would have been open, like my chest, my 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 shirt's open, my jacket's open. I'm all over the place. Cause I, dude, I, I covered like 
how many hundreds of feet? Yeah. You know, and when you're exposed like that, like you want to have your gear tight. And my gear was dialed, dude. <laughs> I've never <laughs> felt as dialed. <laughs> it was sick. And I and it, I'm following that leash up and it goes into the snow. And I'm like, I just like took two hacks, like like Wolverine or whatever with my fists, just hacked at the snow, just like in a crazy animalistic like idea. And boom, on the second hack, uncovered his boot. Wow, how much time had passed? I, I, trying to put that together in my head is probably like anywhere from like four to five minutes. You were at the time. Like, he didn't have much longer. Yeah, no. And his boots. So I, I like just realized, and I'm still confused as fuck because I'm not getting a signal. And I know he's got a beacon. And I see his boots, and I look up, and there's a massive tree. Big old, like four feet around, like dead pine tree. And I can tell he's just... His head is on that tree. And I'm just like, uh, and I look, you know, I just like had kind of being aware of my surroundings. He had come through like jail of trees. So I'm just like, this is no good. This is no good. I'm like, did his beacon get ripped off? Like, I don't know, you know. So I instantly, and this is all in a split second, right? I instantly just went around because like immediately when I found his boots, I was like, airway. That's just what I, I said it out loud. I said, airway. airway. I went right to that tree. I dug down within like, like I pretty much got it down. He was only under the snow, maybe like eight to 12 inches. I got, you know, I got my shovel out and dug down, found his head. He had no goggles. He had, he had his hood on, no beanie. He was face down, head downhill. And his, his head was just to the side of the tree. He was like, he breached the distance of the tree. He was just to the side, not touching it. His shoulder wasn't even touching the tree where he had stopped face down instantly, like got all the snow out of his, uh, out of his, uh, like face front face zone, jam my fingers up in Hit his, in his, yeah. In it, like just, you know, that's what we do. Right. You know, you jam it up their teeth and I'm just like, oh. you know, you didn't know snow in there. So he hadn't been breathing. You know, oh, he hadn't geez. inhaled anything. And I was just like, no, like, and, and, and I was just like, I was like, he's dead. Like this, yeah, this five, is, six minutes. This is gnarly. Like, I, and I didn't think it was from suffocation. I thought it was from trauma. Three. Yeah. I did it again. I just jam. I was just like screaming in my head, just like, no. And, and meanwhile, I'm like screaming. I'm like, I got it. You know, like people were starting to move over like Gordon and, um, and one of the guys from the cat were moving over at that time to like help. And then they started like, as I'm doing this, like they're starting to help like dig him out of the snow. And when I did it again, I don't know if it like stimulated something in there, but all of a sudden he's like, <laughs> and I just was like, he's alive, <laughs> you know, just That's screaming. Like his last uh, breath. It, but maybe. no, he had started again. Oh, he, but he start okay, he already had his last and he's starting again. Yeah. So we finished digging him out rolled him over and like he's starting to like you know like show signs of like starting to breathe so it wasn't like cpr time it was like i just started like slapping him i put him in my lap i just like rolled him over Wake put him in my up. lap slapping him i i was running my fingers up his spine and dude i thought i felt like the gnarliest like softball situation i was like this is not good there's a number of trees he could have hit oh numbers Still, you know, and he's just completely limp. Like, I don't know if he's like a quadriplegic or anything, you know, like I have no idea. And he's just starting to like, like cough and starts to, starting to come back. And he, and I'm seeing like, yeah, he was, he was like stone cold, white, purple, blue. And, and I just was slapping him, just slapping him in the face. Just Mike, 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 Mike. And then he just slowly came back to life. Wow. And just like came back and just was like, uh, you know, regaining consciousness. And he got up and I was just like, Gordon hits me and he's just like looking at me just like, and I'm just like sitting there. I'm just like, I, I, I knew like there's, there's no, there's no, we're not done. Yeah. <laughs> we're not done by any means. There's a million things going on in my head, you know? And it was just like, Okay, and he starts to kind of come back, and I chilled, and I was like, okay, and I was just, I had this moment of, like, 
kind of like everything just got dead silent, dead calm. And mind you, when we dropped in this second run, here's the kicker. It was 4 p.m. Ooh. January. About to be dark. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, I'm gathering my, I'm exhausted, completely exhausted gathering and it just went i just remember like such a calming feeling coming over me and like the the peacefulness of the forest and i was just like it's just kind of crazy you know and then he's like and then he all of a sudden he kind of starts like freaking out i'm like are you good like are your knees good because he jumped up you know he's kind of bouncing around i was like are your knees okay he's like oh no, no i think my knees are okay and i'm like are you injured like just trying to like get any information out of him and he's like i don't know and um I was like, okay. I was like, all right, I got Jeremy up there. I know what situation he's in. Brock is like on him. I trust Brock with my life. Like Brock's on him. I know Jeremy is in good hands or is as good as hands as he can be in at this point. And I was just like, okay, I radioed. I, I don't know if I radioed. I don't know what happened, but I was like, I'm going to, I got to get him to the road. Like I'm going to see him to the road. And in my head, the cat's down there, you know, cause the cat meets you at the bottom and picks you up. And, um, so he's kind of like tweaking and as we got, like, we kind of started walking and I was holding him and I was holding him and I had my snowboard and, and his pow surfer. Right. And, and I was holding it and, and, uh, it's all of a sudden we started getting kind of in the weird section of the slide where it was like, everything was down in the runnel, but the runnel was for full of trees. So you couldn't really walk down there and it was like all windy and nasty. So we kind of popped up on the shoulder and it was more of a clear line, but all of a sudden we just started breaking through the snow. So I was like, okay, sit on this pal surfer. I'm going to side slip behind you and I'm going to use this leash to like hold the control. Like, you know what I mean? To like, it's on the back. So you can just sit there and I'm going to scoot you down. Scooted him down. It took a bit, you know, to get him down to the road. We got down to the road. T-Bird's down there. The cat had went up with Alex and Garrett to go back to the top to help bring mm -hmm. supplies and, and figure out Jeremy. And uh, so the cat was gone, and I was like, okay. I just took a second. I was like, took a big-ass drink of water out of my water bottle. And I was like, T-Bird, do you have any food? He's like, I got this cliff bar. I'm going to give it to Mike. Let him, like, eat on it. And at this time, Mike is starting to trip. He's tripping. There's no cell service. So I'm like, T-Bird, just keep him calm down. He's like, I got you. Like, T-Bird is just <laughs> solid as a rock, mm -hmm. always. So I just was like, okay. And and the way it worked with getting Mike to the road with the pal surfer, I was like, that's I, I, I'm hiking up to get Jeremy. And mind you, this where Jeremy was at was in like the top like two to three hundred vertical feet of this this face. And this face probably to the road was like a thousand vertical feet to the bottom. But it you know, it's longer when it like it's more mellow. I was like, all right, I'm going. I took a big drink of water and I just like, grabbed the pal surfer and just started hiking. It's far, dude. And I was like, I was just going. It was like, go, I was like sprinting as hard as I possibly can. And you're like, there's no superhuman strength, you know what I mean? Like in a situation, you get dead tired. I would go and I'd just take like 10 deep breaths. I'd go as hard as I can and I'd take 10 deep breaths. Go as hard as I can and I'd take 10 deep breaths. And I was just hiking up and hiking up and just, keep, just keeping on the line, you know? And then finally, right when I started right when I got up there and like Alex and Garrett had just moved in and they had just gotten there. Cause that cat was taking so long to get back to the top and it was obviously having some problems and we get up there and they had Jeremy, they're kind of like doing the same thing I did, but he was like sitting on his snowboard with the sharp edges and like the bindings. And, and I was like, get him off that thing, get him on this pal surfer and we're going to, we're going to belay him down the same way I did T-Bird. And they were kind of giving me some resistance. <laughs> and that's what I just went into full general mode. General, and I, just started, general I just out. started shouting. I'm like, get him off the thing and get him on this thing. This is how we were doing it. I don't care. I just did it. This works, you know, cause like it's the pass surfer is dished and it's like clean bottom. And it's like, and you're talking with someone that has some broken bones oh, here, man. You and, gotta, and dude, Brock was just like, in, like, just went into like secret agent mode. He had like probes on. He had splinted with with sticks, oh, he splinted them, sticks and probes and rope, like both legs. Because he knew they were broken. Oh, they were they no were doubt about it. Gone, like nothing attached in there. Rubber splinted legs. him up, 
and and just got him on. So we got him sat down and 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 it and I noticed Jeremy was kind of like obviously he's got no support, so he was kind of slipping off the the and the nose was kind of uh, like going downhill, was kind of like not holding a good line. So I stopped and I was like, someone belay him. You know, Brock is completely exhausted. And he, I'd sent him in front of me. I was like, someone blame. I'm going to go on the front. So I went on the front and I held the nose of the, the pal surfer and kind of had my hands keeping his legs Walking on. backwards. Completely. No, we're not walking. We're in the snow on our knees, <sighs> inching down, knee, knee, knee. Trying to move as vertical. little as possible. Yeah. Having to move. And by this time, dude, it is pitch black. Someone had headlights, you know, like obviously like headlamps. Alex. Yeah, we had headlamps, you know, Alex had gotten supplies from the, the cat. So I was like very key um, bringing the support in, you know. Was he and, in shock or was he in mad pain? Dude, he was in so much pain, so much shock. Every movement. Every movement. He would scream in like the most terrifying scream like of all time because like if we got offline and literally yeah. had to walk backwards in the snow and get him to the road. So we get down to the road finally, and it was just like a big weight, like relief weight off of everybody, and there's no cat. Still. And I'm like, where's the cat? And Alex is like, dude, you know, we, we had to run out of gas. We had to fill it up. The cat was kind of tweaked. I'm going to be honest. The cat is not in good shape. And I'm just like, okay. I was like, mentally making a note. I was like, okay. Got I know that that is the way home, like down that cat road. It's just far. I was like, okay. So we sit there. Alex goes, and him and Garrett start making a fire. Everyone starts piling coats and everything they had on Jeremy, keep him warm, you know. And he's doing he's doing really good, you know, considering Mike, you know, as soon as he saw Jeremy, Mike snapped back together, and he was just like, okay. He was in, like, full, like, let's get Jeremy. You know, oh, yeah. everything went all hands on deck. And then – um all of a sudden, there's like no cat, no cat. And I'm like, Alex, we got to start making a decision here. As soon how, as I said far? that, as soon as I'm, dude, it was, I, I don't know. That's the thing. Like, I don't know actual, but like how far. And then um, it was far. It was really far. And then as soon as I said that to, to Alex, I see the headlight of the cat. And it was just like, whew. I was like, cool. Okay, here comes the cat. Everyone's cheering. Everyone's so stoked. Everyone's so stoked. I'm just kind of like, okay. Next, everyone gets Jeremy and the cat. Everyone's piling their coats off. Everyone's getting in there. We're getting out of there mentally, just mapping it out. Okay, we get, we get him to the car. We just get him in. Like, like we get in the cat, we're going. And it's like, okay, we're getting in that vehicle. You are driving, T-Bird. We're going to the Park City Park Hospital. Park City's the closest yeah, one. Because right close, it's exit. like, we're right in Oakley there, right? Yeah. Um, so we're just mapping all this thing out, and we're going, and we're cruising. And I'm, I look at the dudes. I'm like, how far? They're all... 40 minutes, like, like whatever they said, like two miles, like 40 minutes. I'm like, okay, cruising, we're cruising, we're cruising, we're cruising, we're cruising. And, you know, and I'm still, I just have this pit in my stomach, you know, we're not out yet. You're not out until you're out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how far? And he's like, we're like a a half mile, uh, 20 minutes or a mile, whatever he said, you know, and I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And then boom, like a light switch cat dead dead in the water like it is done motor off headlights off power off done they go to click the ignition nothing i'm talking nothing not even a spark of like a you know and i'm just like i just like was like t-bird let's go grab the jackets so me t-bird and mary we 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 were just like we're walking out we got to walk out. We got to get to the truck. And as that, as we were walking away, the dude's like, yeah, so what we need to do is we need to like go down there and call someone with a snowmobile. I'm like, it is search and rescue time. It is nine one one. This, we are, this, mm-hmm. this is like an absolute emergency upon emergency. And mind you, dude, the whole day was snowing. Like it was like Japan up there. It was snowing so hard the whole day. And it was just like, it was gnarly. Soon as we got out of the cat and started walking, it just crystal clear, like a big ass full moon. And I was like, I remember like, I was like, damn, 
kind of a beautiful night. <laughs> Mary <laughs> and, and T-Bird are fast, too. Yeah, and those guys, and we were just like, we, we, I, we all have never ran yeah. on in like six inches of powder snow. Because it was like, you know, the cat pa- packed the snow going up, but then there's maybe six inches of new minimum. So we're charging through, and it's real light and fluffy snow. And, you know, we're just hauling ass. And then wherever we could, we would skate and just skate and skate and skate and skate and skate. And then we were just like at the end, we were basically just fast walking as hard as we possibly can. I'm like, are you, the whole time I'm like, are you good, Mary? Are you good, T-Bird? And they're like, you know, they're like, yep, good. And, they, you know, they're checking in on me. They're che- Everyone was just checking in. We're just tripping like crazy shit is going through my head, you know, and just like everything. And I'm like, okay, T-Bird, you are driving, Mary, you are calling 911. And I'm going to just, I'm going to take care of calling like Jeremy's wife and, and, you know, figuring all this out and being able to like not be on, not be, not being able to do anything to help like make a a solid decision, a solid choice. So we get down there and we're just, it took a long time to get to the car. And then, uh, we ended up getting to the car and then we drove out, we just fired out to Oakley and then that's where we made the call. And, and it ended up being like, it's like three and a half miles. Wow. That we that we tr- walked that out of there, tricked. and then uh, instantly Mary just did such a just a phenomenal like the best job of all time of like talking with uh, the search and rescue and lining it up. They l- luckily there was like a heli already at the U, mm. and they just peeled up and then just pulled out and they just charged and and it was dude it was nuking and it's been nuking so like there was like a very slim chance that you know it could land. So when the, and I told them, you know, when through the, you know, through the, the conversation, it was like, we had broke down right where we did our beacon check in that little like parking lot area with the cat, like with the, with the bathrooms on Smith and Morehouse Reservoir. So it was super easy to be like, right here, go to Smith and Morehouse where Reservoir, it's at the public bathrooms. That's where they are. Wow. So the heli comes in. I guess they kind of had to circle a bit, and then they got they landed, and it kind of took a while to get Jeremy over there and get him assessed and get him like in there and ready to go. And dude, they barely were able to take off because the storm. They were almost like not able to take off. They got out of there, and then we we stayed down there on the phone with the with the search and rescue and didn't want to leave because even the trailhead had no service. So it was like. Once we get confirmation that the heli is lifted off and on its way to the hospital, then we'll go up and in to go get the the rest of the crew. Mm. So once we finally did, we we started heading up the road, and where we parked was kind of like there's like kind of like this like two like like little like town roads to get up to that little like uh, um, canyon, the the road to the the reservoir. So. We were over here and it was just dead the whole time. Like we didn't see anybody. There was, you know, the, the sheriff had stopped by and was like talking to us, you know, because he obviously got the call and everything. And as we were going up, we see um, a truck driving down the road and the heli was like 50 feet above it, like winding out the canyon because like it, it started, the storm had started again and was like tracking off of the headlights to get out and then they, then they could go. And, and fly to the hospital. And they actually had to get redirected to a different hospital than they originally had wanted, like Murray, or this, they got redirected. He had broken femurs, right? No, it was tib oh, okay, because t- femurs can, like, yep. you can die from moving them. Yeah. And, because, like, and, dude, when we got there, we were waiting for the cat. Like, he was going into hypothermia. Even in the cat, like, he was going into hypothermia. It was, like, not good. He was not in good shape. But he was, but with Jeremy, like, dude, he's the strongest person, like, most resilient person I've ever known. So you, you, it's hard to, like, know that, you know? But, dude, once we got up to the, like, parking lot, every bad boy from, like, Wyoming to Idaho was in that parking lot. Was, wah, 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 like, like, let's go save some people. And, you know, they got, oh, the, they call. got the call. They pulled, <laughs> in, they pulled in everybody. They all, like, all, it was like a swarm of snowmobiles and trucks and trailers. And she's like, ah. And I guess it was like, once they got up to the cat, and they had a little mini cat, like basically the same thing. And once they got up there, they're like, "Where is it? Where we got saved? What do we got to do?" And they're like, "And Alex is all, oh no, like he's gotten the heli, 
where he's good. What about someone else? You know, because there was there was. They just uh, want to save a life, huh? <laughs> yeah, there was there was news on the radio. That someone else was in the avalanche, but you know uh, he was out. And, he was good, and good. And then they were just like, oh. And then I think Alex or Garrett or someone was just like, actually, all we need to do is like move all that shit in that cat over to that cat, and then go. And they're like, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These guys wanted to save yeah, a goddamn life. <laughs> they did. <laughs> so then they charged out of there, you know, and we charged out of there and and uh, yeah. Dude, I got to say, one, your response is amazing to your storytelling. Good lord, man. <laughs> I've ne- an incredible story right captivating. there. Captivating. I was captivated, dude. I've never wow. really told that publicly. I've never heard that part of it. No, I've, I've heard never T-Bird. heard that side. I've heard yeah. Alex's side too. Yeah. yeah, everyone that's, has different sides, you know. That's the way yeah. I saw it because that's what. You well, T Bird, all he said is, "You were the fucking man." That's all yeah. he said. <laughs> the general, the yeah, general. the general ran the fucking show, well, and I just did what he told me. It was, you know, all those, all those stories, you know, that you get in all those trainings. It's just like you're never gonna take it all in, but you, you do cumulatively get a lot out of it, and you like understand it and the key things. Like I, when I, you know, like. There was scenarios when they were talking about like, oh yeah, when people are like they're, they're panicking and it's crazy, you just gotta literally look them in the eye and shout at them. True, slap and them. <laughs> I just started doing that, yeah. you know. So that's what they said, you know. Dude. That's what I've been trained. So, but I I don't know, and and you know it's funny too because like there's tons of good avalanche trainings. Please, everyone get avalanche training. I need more, way more. I need uh, I need to go. It's in. It's kind of like it. LeBlanc and meditation and whatnot. Can yeah. you ever have enough? Never. Probably not. Enough. Right. True. You need and to this, stay crispy. This year, they're claiming there's going to be more people in the backcountry yeah. than ever because of COVID and mountains yeah. not allowing as many people. And kids might, their parents might buy them a split board, send them off. Oh, great, have fun with it. No experience. Let's get some experience, man. Dude. We don't. We don't need to hear the stories of losing people. No. Early and in the season, the and- silver lining that. You know, through the whole experience, you know, like we go through, you know, all these like self confidence. I was kind of touched on that earlier, and like these issues, and like you know, kind of like coming out of snowboarding and these like weird little depressions and whatnot. But that experience is like as crappy as it was. It like, I don't know. I, it's not. It's in like no like vanity type of way, but it just kind of was like such a relief in the fact. That I was like, I know it wasn't perfect. It was ugly. It was gnarly. It was like my my actions were not clean, nothing. But at the end of the day, I was just like, the the silver lining was the Utah Avi after this the season was over. They're all this was the first season in Utah in like either nine or eleven years that we didn't have a fatality. Really, I was gonna say there's always one. I always yep. hear of one. Yeah. Preseason, there's like grass with snow on it. Yeah. Always slides. That's incredible, dude. And you basically helped yeah, make and, that a stat. And having that, you know, and I've talked to Mike a lot and like, you know, it's it's amazing and it's just it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like I anybody would have done it for me, anybody would have done it for him, but it made you know, on just such a different level of just knowing the fact and it in that realization moment that I was telling you about where everything got calm and silent. What kind of blanketed me was I knew exactly that is like in in any situation, I knew exactly where I needed to be that day. As far as like, you know, I was I was saying like, oh, I don't know if I should go. Like, I just got this like kind of new role. You know, it was it was a realization is like I needed to be here today. And it felt you're exactly where you need to be. Yeah, exactly. And it felt good. Like. Is you know as gnarly as that was, it like pulled me out of a lot of like self confidence funks. Not that like it's I'm like thinking like oh I know anything or I'm the man. It's it's more of just like, damn dude, like you're at war and you kind of made you made it through something. Like what else can I make it through? You know, like it kind of was like a refreshing feeling, like that. Because oh, yeah. dude, it is that's so sick. It is all out panic. It is all out war. And I tell you that no matter how much training or scenario training you do, although it is good, but it is never like it is in training. It is never clean. What I tell people, I'm like, just when you're training, take your time. When they're always like yelling at you and trying to tell you to like go fast, go this, he's, he's dying, he's breathing. Do not train like that. Train very slow. Train very calculated 
learn it in absolute like 500 frames a second slow-mo because because then when you do do it it's just going to be that much more easy like clockwork yeah. yeah like pack your bag like be conscious when you go out in the back country pack your bag where is your shovel where is how did you put it in there you know make little mental notes like where's your water where's this like like just take your time because Anybody that goes out there, I don't care, like, you know, sometimes it happens the first day you go out there, or maybe it takes 50 years. It's, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's going to be a scenario where you're going to have to, you know, think fast and be completely situationally aware. Well, some people panic in these situations, too, and well, you've got to have someone that holds it together, man. And they, well, they say uh, fast is smooth, smooth is slow. Yep. And that sounds like... Where you were at, and you fucking saved some goddamn lives, man. Yeah, it's, dude. It's unbelievable. Uh, so we're going to do a little pivot. That was an amazing story. Another topic I would like to get into is fatherhood, man. It's, uh, you know, I see your kid every Halloween. I've watched him grow. He's, uh, how old is he now? He's 12. Yeah. Oof. And, yeah, the, Mason's great. Like, that's my son. Um Having that experience has just been completely uplifting. Yeah, everyone says it, but you don't really understand it until you are in the situation. And, you know, for the longest time, it's like, you know, as he found kind of like his, his kind of, you know, curiousness for like skateboarding and snowboarding. I, I mean, I had him on the mountain. Sorry, me and Brock had our kids on the mountain because our kids, Brock's boy is four days Younger than my son. You guys plan yeah. that or what? Jeez. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, but it was kind of sick. But anyways, we've we've had our boys up on the mountain since they were like one. You know, they couldn't even stand, and we're like taking them on Explorer. And Mason kind of got into snowboarding, and and you know, I take him all the time, and and he he didn't really like bite, like not even close. Like he was kind of like I got these goggles and this helmet and this like. I couldn't even put a helmet on him. He would just bug out. And, you can't and force it. Cold, no. Goggles, no way. He'd go up there and he'd have fun for like maybe five minutes. Luckily, we live like 20 minutes from Brighton. Yeah, take him home. <laughs> I've done many a days <laughs> where it's one run. Or maybe we don't even make it to the chair. I don't know. We just really? Go, we'll just go up and have hot cocoa. But I was trying to make that experience really good for him, you know? And like giving him something that is just fun, yeah, and he gets stoked. a little treat, yeah. And and we we went on for years, and I, and that was just kind of like, oh, maybe he's into it, maybe he's not. I have no idea. Anyways, and then um, and then all of a sudden one day, I actually got it on film. I made a little like edit, and it's and I kept telling him it was the day that it clicked. And I watched it, and I had the dad cam out. It was actual dad cam. Actual dad cam using <laughs> and, um, a dad cam. Yeah, and I'm Hit filming. The daddy cam. Him. I'm filming him, and I'm watching him like look there and go there and control his snowboard and do the little tricks. And he's jumping, and I'm just like mouth just shut, just like, oh my god, he's this doing is it. So he's doing it. <laughs> he's doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and, like, when I'm, like, traveling a lot in the winter, it's hard to, like, you know, like, I got to get him up there. I got to I gotta make it a point. I'm getting him up there on the weekends, whatever, you know, and it's cool. But, yeah, watching that click, and then all of a sudden he started, he just, like, one day, like, he was kind of, he like, kind of rode a scooter, and then he took a scooter to the skate park a while ago, or a long time ago, and, like, left it there. And I bought him, like, a $200 scooter. He just left it at the he park? He just did. Yeah, just <laughs> later. Move. That's a dick move. Someone <laughs> probably gave him some shit, and he's just, like, I'm just. Nah, he was just so young and just didn't really oh, he just didn't, didn't care. Like care. And I would take like, him to Guthrie all the time. He's been going to Guthrie before he could even yeah, stand. I mean, it's like, like blocks yeah, from your house. Totally. So, you know, and then one day he just started like, I don't really saw YouTube. Like, he's like big into YouTube. All kids are in uh, uh, tech techs, fingerboards. Mm. And he started like, all of a sudden he starts wrapping off all these uh, trick names to these like different flip tricks i'm like wait what <laughs> yeah and then all of a sudden that led to like this like braille skateboarding so now he's gonna he's not gonna get interested in skateboarding by watching a zero video like it's not gonna appeal to like a you know a 10 year old kid yeah but um this braille skateboarding like all of a sudden these guys are funny and they're doing their youtube thing and they're like youtube skateboarders and i'm just like yeah yeah 
<laughs> and he Keep stopped. <laughs> yeah, he stopped scooter and like I got him another scooter and he maybe rode it twice, whatever. And and then he just wanted a skateboard. He had a he's had a skateboard forever, so he just started getting on the skateboard and like all of a sudden just like going. And that's it's been within the last year. So yeah, he's just been like taking off and being able to like watch that is just incredible. Like that has just been like such a fulfilling thing because like. I'm not even trying to push my kid into doing anything like whatever he's into. Like he was doing plays for a minute and I thought that was the sickest thing. And yeah. like, if he wanted to do whatever, I'm just like support, support. wagon now, but that he's actually like, kind of like interested and curious about snowboarding and skateboarding. It obviously I'm just fired up. Does he and know like, how cool it is that his dad works for Volcom? <laughs> I don't know. He wears like all sorts of. I mean, I get. He's got a closet full of Volcom gear, and like <laughs> he he knows what's up, and he likes to wear Vans and stuff. But he's like more fired up on like, you know, all this other gear. Like Whatever he wants Jordan. He into. wants Jordans, dude. He wants. They like the Supreme and the Jordans. Yeah. That's what the kids like these days. Dude. Yeah. He ever is there ever when you're snowboarding? You're like he's like yeah, Dad. He's still got the switchback roadie. Does he ever hit you? <laughs> Has he throwing that out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he throws it out like it's so funny too because he grows up with like jp and jeremy around and then also like pat moore and like yeah took him snowboarding like tour gears first time to brighton last year um he came with mason and, to and pat we had a little fun little day and mason's like juiced he's like tour gears the sickest snowboarder i've ever seen and tour like, gear's pretty dope <laughs> yeah and then all the homies at like blum is always at my house reed you know living with me forever like all the influence is like really cool. Like I, I, I hit up the dust box um, this summer because like, you know, through everything and I'm working all the time. I'm like, and he's not going to school because it's all in here. I'm like, I'm like, Cody, Benny, Reed, come get Mason. Just take him and go somewhere. Just give the kid a good time, yeah, man. With go. COVID, he's hanging with no one, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's the only child. And I'm just like, I don't yeah. care, dude. The kid just he's needs bored something. out of his mind. Yeah. So they came and got him, took him to the skate park, took him to the dust box, and like, <laughs> wow. well, they're watching skate <laughs> videos. Should actually be illegal, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was so what are they? What is he? They're all lightening up, and he's just they, no. They kept it. They way know chill. it's up. They yeah, know the they general. They kept it way. Chill. They don't want to upset the general. <laughs> you, don't want to upset the general. <laughs> you would not want the general coming over there with some uh, dude. Now you didn't spend any time in college, right? I, I actually tried. You like, tried like a couple semesters, but dude, I was like at that time of my life, like you were shredding. I'm on a snowboard. I think it's just insane, and it says something about snowboarding. The fact that here you are, you didn't do any days in or little in college. You tried. Now you're working for this big, cool ass brand. In many other walks of life, that's not happening without that college certificate, and that's dope, man. And it says something about snowboarding and. You don't have to get that shit. Do what you want. Do what you're passionate about and chase it. And yeah. here you are, man. I mean, if you're passionate, just like you say, and you it's put a lot of emotion and you put emotion into what you do and you love what you do and you want to do it. Like there's no, like I tell Mason that every single day. I'm like, the world is yours. If you want to do something, you can do it. There is nothing holding you back. I'm like the only thing that'll hold you back is yourself. yourself. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's the words I live by, I guess, to tell yeah. that to the Patreon. Like, you just got to do it. You commit and just do it. Like, be yourself. Trust yourself as much as you possibly can. And just, like, if you want it bad enough, you will do it. Find what you love. Figure yeah. out how to make a career out of it. And it's never going to feel like you worked a day in your life. Put it in your head. I mean, like, like my role models, you know, like, like uh, there's many. But, like, when I look at Brian Gucci and his lifestyle and his family and the way he's, like, you know, taken like he's a lifetime shredder like like shredding lifetime. is not is not like an age it's not a no. phase it's nothing like like when you shred like it doesn't matter what you're on it's not the the vehicle or the vessel all the time it's it's just your mindset and what you what drives you and where you want to go and like i look at gooch and like he's got his family up in jackson he he uprooted southern california left the like pro snowboarding spotlight moved to Jackson because that's what he felt like he needed to do and he's just living it dude and he's doing it and he's stoked and he could be doing anything and he would be just fired up like he is the most like I don't know I just I every anytime I'm around the Gooch man I'm just a sponge take it in and like Temple too you know like 
a dude like Temple, like I would go out to, I actually, I did this skate tour with our, uh, we did a collab with Girl Skateboards this, over this last season. And Remy, um, you know, the skate department head, Remy Stratton, legend, shouts to Remy. Yeah, full on. Get, let's yeah, get give him a shouts to Remy, <laughs> shouts to Kaylin, shouts <laughs> to Nook, everyone in the office holding it down of Volcom. Um, but he invited me on this trip because I love to film. And skateboarding, I, I, I nerd out on it. Yeah. And whatever. And he invites me on this trip and is insane. As Simon was our our uh, uh, our rider, Simon Banero. He's from up the, up in Washington. I've never, like, experienced Washington in July. And Washington's always, like, the winter. It's raining. It's snowing and whatever. You know what I mean? But going up there in the summer was insane. And then the girl team was there with, like, Rick Howard and, like, Manchild and um, Griffin Gass and Niels Bennett. And we did this sickest tour because it's like it's all camping because it's all like COVID, whatever, you know. And mm. like we cruised and Simon had the sickest route to went like we were in Seattle. We were up like up in uh, Cold Pad, up in um, up in Glacier. Those guys like set it up for us. And then we went out to Temple's house. And I'd never been out. I've heard about um, uh, Port Angeles and everything like because like Blair lives out there. Um, Scott Sullivan, and then um, my old Volcom team manager Ryan Boys. Shouts he's out to there. Boys. I've seen him in ages. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's out there now, and and we rolled through, and like Nathan Yant was there, dude. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. And we 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 like Temple's got the sickest like plot of land. He's like right on the coast, just like you know a few hundred yards in, and his house and his land is all secluded back there, and he's built up the. Full, he meant full mud dogs, you know. Oh, got, you mud dogs. Okay. Oh, yeah. He's got quarter pipes. He's got sick little rollers. He's got everything. It's the dopest little, like, driveway skate park. And I'm sitting there watching him and Barrett, and I'm just, like, reflecting and just, like, dang, dude. It is so rad that these guys have support from, like, the snowboard industry. They're both, like, lifers. Lifer yeah. legends. <laughs> Canyon, their son, is just ridiculous ridiculously tearing his front driveway with the sickest style of all time you know <sighs> meanwhile like the girl team and and uh, and the volcom skaters are just going ape like, yeah full-blown animals what a scene and they put us up for a night it was insane and like just getting to experience that and it's just like it's like snowboarding creates some amazing lives and it's like Definitely fortunate. Something worth chasing. That's yeah. That's for sure, man. Whatever. Get oh, in where you fit in. There's lots of ways to fit in. Yeah. And if you, you want it bad enough, dude, it's, it's yours. It's going to happen. Exactly. It's yours. And, like, it's it's rad that, you know, we all do stuff like this. And yeah, get man. the opportunity because I know a lot of people don't get that opportunity. And, you know, now, like, there's, get you know, getting to be more and more opportunities and for, like, a lot more people to, to experience this because, like, I'm. I know. Like I owe it everything. Like it doesn't owe me anything. Same like, here, man. I owe it everything. Every life. Every every like good piece of like knowledge and like life or something that I've learned has one way or another come from snowboarding. Yeah. You know what I mean. Look at Grenier. He's a master welder, concrete builder. <laughs> like he's. I mean, like we always used to joke. Like, what? How many things do you have to be pro at? To be a pro snowboarder. <laughs> True, huh? <laughs> the skill sets. Oh, you want a snowmobile? It's not easy. <laughs> like, we got to come a well, master. To circle back around to the mentality of, like, you make it through that avalanche. It's like, you make it through this, you can make it through anything. And then snowboarding, you you maybe you accomplish something in that that you never thought you could do. Maybe you can accomplish this. And it gives you, and I would attribute, you know, while, right along that conversation line that we're talking about, a lot of self-confidence comes from snowboarding, too, when you're like, Oh shit! I I was scared to hit this jump, and I did it. And now I got myself a little confidence, and like fuck, that just carries through in everything in your life. So yeah, sitting in the office is malsky compared to dealing with that day of the avalanche. Yeah, yeah. You can handle it's, anything. Yeah, straight up. Well, dude, I think yeah, we did it. I think we did this, dog. We've been talking a long time. You. Are amazing, dude. No, thank you guys so much. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on here. It's such an honor. I love what you guys are doing. You guys holding it down for snowboarding through all everything. Like, good. 
Like I, I'm just like shouts to you two. <laughs> <laughs> Give it air <laughs> horn. Come no, on, we're getting some air horns. All right, something to do, dude. Yeah, straight up. Well, Hell we, yeah. We really appreciate you guys listening, and Seth, we appreciate you coming into our garage mm-hmm. and just uh, shooting the shit for a little bit. And like always, we got a new episode coming for you guys next week. Thank you for tuning in.